Merhaban, akkom el episodju ihor tal-podcast, jekk ix-xogħol qed jogħġobkom tinsewx ħafsu like jekk qegħdin fuq il-paġna tal-Facebook, subscribe jekk qegħdin fuq il-YouTube, tuna daqq qagħdit kull qalb trid oħra. Il-podcast tal-om huwa flimkien ma' ħlbieb tiegħi John Spartan, John Spartan li trabba ġewwa Brooklyn fi New York, huwa wkoll eks militar kien parti mill-Navy Amerikana u kien wkoll champion tal-istat ta' New York fil-ġimnastika li kellu wkoll ħafna ġrajiet tal-ħajja li kienu pjuttost diffiċli sawruh fil-bniedem li u għallum. Ma ġuna tkellimna fuq il-militar, il-paternita tkellimna fuq il-ġinnastika għaddoleċenza fi New York li jena ma konna fxejd għara u fil-fat minn emmek nibtu bosta stejjer li għeldu u li sormi ma stiġu. Il-main sponsor ta' dan l-episodju u ma nisan li bħalissandom il-ġuk għal-bħ għal-1200 u 50 euro karot sabsura moderna li minn kejja maqtu għana għamil l-art mux ħazin xorta għanda diki s-sura kupe. Nisħa li ma għamra u kol teknoloġija avvanzata ħafna u fil-xolom sassibu n-nies ta' tzokkor li jajnukom li jifmu kem xolom u kem fil-karotza jina naf, ħax għammilt nofsa nar il-xolom u nisħa li tallim tiktar fuq il-karotzi da kinar mill-ninterieta ta' ħajti kolla għal-daqstant jek għedin fissu għal-karotza morwatu titwila il-ġug. Tal-men apsa nerġaw nibdew bil-kalendarju ta'na ta' t-tivitajit għal-daqstant jek t-xtiq tkun għal-ġorna d-dak li da kollu sejġ bil-men up kem t-tibatulna e-mail hello at men up malta dot com u minna mekka għna sena għorna kom jem kalendarju s-xiħ ta' t-tivitajit li manof ġornata, ġornata, weekend etc. għal-daqstant hello at manapmalta.com biex nzommukom għadġurnati. Ħajru koll l-likebs issa li restoranti, il-bars, il-kazini koll la fetħu sarra ħrasek li nħan kun min ta' uddim li mburi nsibsi għad divertiment għal daqstant jekk sen il-xrob zgur sen interpella l-app ta' likebs biex wassal kem li lu kem il-mara l-ura d-dar għawinu s-xaħ likebs bħal ma tafu jaslu fejk flin għas ħin u blin għas prez nizlu l-app u jekka t-fitxu bċejjeġ dekorativi ta' kull xorta għanka daw kien fas l-askont il-ħtiġijietu l-bżonni jitta kom etnitkellem fuq mirja, lamp shades, arloġi, vazuni, valletta, glas, ilon fissu t-nejn u ħam sin sena jamlu dawn l-xorta ta' bċejjeġ dekorativi ta' ħġiġ għal daqstant jo izzuruħum di persona jo għanka jalla t-staw għanka t-fitxu għan fuq il-social media Facebook u mat-tegjati f'dan il-video il-kumpanija zvediza Orange Man edha tajn l-bosta maltin biex jaqtaw dak il-vizju meri ta' t-tipip itlu ġewa Orange Man dot store biex taraw l-azla vasta ta' azliet li jem biex wieħed jeleb dan il-vizju skont il-bżonniet u il-preferenzi ta' akom u ma għandum il-prodot Orange Man dot store ta' bilħa entom uħerġin tinsew xtik buġon mallija kaps bitrikbar biex tijedu skont toħxin filmija fuq l-ewwel ordnis. Xajru koll l-klik tal-kameras li ġentilmen prof dulna biex niġdu dan il-podcast u għal daqstant l-appoċ li għet juru għal dan il-podcast klik nirdingrazzjakom. Inselli ovjament għal Andrew ta' Derek Butcher 9986-6425 jekk tiċtiħu li Derek jasal fuq l-għad batakom fizmint minja u erbejn si għajowen għas blordni taħkom 9986-6425 xanna der l-introduzzjoni tintem għawnek naddu issa l-episod ju iħor tal-podcast ta' John flimkien ma' John Spartan. Bili dafa u nnajdu kem għal baz Mil wahda nehil bu t-nejn Bili fmuċ t-bax għad rednu Nistaqsu kif u x-fahta u fej Il-barta s-saġan Bili-barta s-saġan Mala t-lana Eh, so Just a quick introduction of I just want to let the audience know How you kind of came on my radar Um, and I was, uh, you, you remember you used to organize those uh, like community workouts on a Sunday on a and Sunday. they were free for yeah, everyone man. in the area. Yeah, just get people fit. And uh, and obviously you had like such a huge commitment to it. Like it, it was never like if we we're going to meet at 10, you'd turn up at 10.30 and maybe was, you know, by the time we get there at 10, you have it all fleshed out. And you used to also do it for the kids. So there was an adult session. Yeah, yeah. And then and my kid used to come as well to the kids session. Yeah, 
And it was a time when I was fucking broke, man. I had nothing. So I didn't afford the gym. Bro, I didn't even know that. Man, and uh, the fact that I could come to your workout and at least feel like I have some control over some stuff in my life. And your workouts are, you know, you have a reputation. They're, 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 they're difficult and you have to bring the some I don't know something you have to exercise some kind of demon at you to complete them you have to embrace the suck and yeah, yeah 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 and and, and you you wind up uh, learning how to struggle beautifully yeah man I, th- I think it's uh it's 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 bringing physical pain and and mental endurance you know like trying to build the body with the mind because yeah. I believe that if you don't you don't have the mind you're not gonna you're not gonna build the body yeah and uh, anyway I used to take I used to, you know, I, I was I was very depressed and I was very low everywhere else in my life. But those workouts made me realize that, uh, bro, you still have something in yourself that can do difficult things. And then I kind of applied that mindset and attitude uh, across everything else I did in life. Um, and eventually, uh, things things got better. So you were definitely you, along with Jordan Peterson, along with obviously my family and and friends. But you are definitely. Uh, one of the cornerstones to uh, help me be where I'm at today, mentally and okay. and and ov- and also like in a in a practical sense. Well, the reason I'm sitting here is is due in part to you. So thanks, man. Bro, man, that touches me, man. Honestly, I I didn't even know, and then you, you told me you were like, I was like, wow, no shade. It's amazing. <laughs> So, um, obviously, you're in Malta now, but uh, like we can tell from your accent, you're obviously not from around here. No, I'm from New York, man. Yeah. Uh, which, which part of New York? Well, I was born and raised in, in Brooklyn, but I also floated into uh, Long Island as well. So, I did a lot of moving around. Okay. And, and uh, so, you're born in New York. And what, what was it like, man, as a kid in New York? Oh, in if you can just like... Uh, well, I was born in... Uh, in uh, more of a ghetto area, you know. So the area that I was in was like a uh, Jewish Italian community, and if you went down three or four blocks, then it would turn, you know, into a blacker community, and you had to like defend your block. It was like the uh, what block? Defend your streets. Ah, defend your block. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, we were raised to be uh, man racists, and uh, we did. Uh, we were raised wrong. We were raised wrong. I had to learn right, and. Um, that was tough, man. It's tough because when your parents are telling you, you 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 defend the street, man. You make sure that they don't come over here, you know. And you're like, who? And then it was like, them. You know? <laughs> so it was crazy. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's a different lifestyle, man. It was uh, something totally different. So I can understand when people say thug life and this and that. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, you try to stay away from it, but that area, not. It's not happening. It's just yeah. it's in your face. I've seen people get carjacked. Uh, you're just looking at, you know, things on a different level, totally different level. And uh, how long did you ever get, like, involved in any of this, like, gang shit and street turf uh, shit? And I mean, bad, bad shit? No. I mean, did we do stupid shit? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, I, I put sugar in gas tanks on, you know, a trucker flipped us off, and then we'd follow them down. What, what's the engines. consequence of anyone know what the consequence is for when you put sugar in a tank? What happens? Oh, you destroy the fucking engine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just yeah. seizes the car. You seize yeah, it. Of course, Mark knows. You totally destroy the car. I um, mean, we've done stupid shit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fights. Just you know, supporting your buddy. You know, it could have been over anything. Yeah, and and was that. Uh, uh, was that like uh, something your mother was concerned with? Something your your family was? Yeah. The funny thing about my mom is that my mom, she was a young mom. She was like a kid raising a kid, and it was like uh, just come back home for dinner, you know, or you know when the sun comes down. So it was like there was no guidance, you know. I kind of just I was able to do whatever the fuck I wanted to do. And. Uh... When you say like she didn't give a shit what you did, that she didn't ask, she did like she went. Yeah, so it's a catch twenty two, you know. She didn't give a shit mm. if I came home fine, you know. Be like, oh, had fun, yeah, great. If I came back and you know if someone else knocked on the door, <laughs> problem. Uh, what and what what would the would the consequence of that be with your mother? I uh, yelling and screaming and telling me that maybe I'd get grounded in my room, which. Uh, no, because then she didn't want me in the house. So, 
Like, why why didn't she want you in the house? I just do my own fucking thing, you know. Get out of her hair, you know. She had her thing. She did her thing. What what was her thing? Uh, well, she was a she was a beautician, so I mean, she worked that, and then she worked at a psychiatric hospital. That was later on, though, when we moved into uh, in Long Island. So she would be doing more like hair. I don't know what her thing was, to be honest, man. I mean, man, I went outside. But, but as a kid, what was it like? I, I mean, I, okay, I kind of get what the environment's like. It sounds like a very, like a dangerous yeah. environment, perhaps uh, an environment that can like lead you in, in very, into very difficult situations, perhaps even as a as a child to kind of process those kind of situations. Right. Uh, but th did you have like a thing that you aspired to as a child? You know, I, I, I moved into uh, a, a school, uh, which uh, was my grandmother. Uh, when I moved in with my grandmother, mm. I went to Smithtown. And Smithtown School had a uh, gymnastics program. And uh, when I saw them doing, you know, flips and stuff, I was like, wow, that's cool, man. I'd, I'd like to flip too, you know. So that was, that was a pretty, um, that was a changing moment, you know, where I said, okay, you know, I'd like to go into, you know, sports. And to, you know, challenge myself. Because I wasn't, you know, I was just hanging out and, you know, fighting kids, uh, you know, protecting my turf, you know. Yeah. Uh, jumping roofs, you know, buildings. So in a way, we were already kind of athletic, but in a, yeah, perhaps stupid a more way. delinquent uh, Oh, delinquent, stupid idiots, you know, with two other guys, Big Mike and Little Mike. And it was me, John. So Big Mike, Little Mike, John. And we'd always hang around doing delinquent shit. And... I moved to Long Island. I didn't have any friends. I was like, oh, walking around the school. I saw, you know, these guys competing, you know, doing, you know, parallel bars, doing high bar. And I didn't was, know what it was. Was your mom, was. like, happy that you finally kind of... Uh... Well, I was, living, I was living with my grandmother at the time. So did she know about it? Then she told me she was a gymnast. So maybe it ran into the, the blood, you know? I don't, I don't your know. Your mom was a gymnast too? She was as well, yeah. Okay. And, uh, like... Uh... To what level was she doing gymnastics? She didn't get she didn't get as high as I did in in level, but um, she she did well. You know, I think uh, she could do like back handsprings, and I mean, she was in the recreational side. I would say, okay. you know, where I got more on the elite side. Okay, and uh, so uh, you, I'm getting that, of course. Like your mom is the person that raised you mostly. Yeah, man, she was she was tough mom. You know, uh, tough as in. Man, tough as nails. I mean, uh, she'd be the type of person that would, like, if you double-crossed her, man, she'd freak, man. Just get on you. Very vindictive person. So if you hit her, uh, if you get to her nerves, she's going to get on you. And it's like, no holes barred, man. Okay. Yeah. And uh... that's what ultimately, that's what ultimately crippled her, is that when you, when you push her, man, she'll go to the extreme. Did she become like a victim of her own ferociousness? Man, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was sad to see that. Um, you know, there, there were people in, in my family that didn't tell me, you know, your mom was a narcissist. And she was someone that was, you know, very aggressive. You know, she used to, when she was a kid, she was like a tomboy. She used to beat up the boys that used to pick on my, uh, my aunts or her sister. And she used to defend him, you know, because she didn't care, you know. Um, when she got older, she kept that kind of behavior. And, um, you know, she found a fitting job, you know, like when uh, paying the bills, you know, with the hair, mm -hmm. wasn't cutting it. She became, uh, you know, a white coat back in the day. You know, they needed people to restrain, you know. Uh, people at the psychiatric wards. People at the psychiatric wards. So she was that person. Oh, okay. know, to go take people down. So in a, in a sense, like the toughness paid off in that sense? Yeah, I, maybe that it might have been the, that might have been a precursor to her losing all of her mind. You know, I, I mean, she honestly, she turned into a patient herself, you know? She was never admitted to what I, I don't know if she did or not because I, I had to excommunicate myself at one point in my time in my life. But uh, I, I, to, you know, unbeknownst to me, I, I, I don't think that she's, you know, been in a psychiatric unit. But I think she could have. She's gone to, 
that level. Mm. And it all started with my with my sister when the when that issue happened, then she she crumbled. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, how many siblings do you have? You have another two siblings, right? Like you so, had another so, two siblings. Yeah. So I have a brother and I have a sister. Right. So it was three of us. And there, I never referred to my brother as a half brother. Okay. You know, I was always raised to saying that that was my brother and my okay. sister being my sister, but they're from different fathers. Okay. You know, so my mom's been around. You know, I saw a lot of men coming in and out of the house. So for me, that was you know. Normal. It was normal to one day someone banged on the door and then my mom tells me, hey, John, we've got to rent a U-Haul truck and move out tomorrow. And I was like a professional mover. I still, I can probably move you out in two days. Full house. And why, we why, why, why would you need to move? What would, what are, getting what are evicted, the cause? Man. We're getting oh, evicted. Okay. Yeah, just totally evicted. And I, I didn't know. I just thought... You know, she always played it off as, uh, oh, we're going to get a house. I'm going to get somewhere nicer. And it would always be, you know, not nicer. Huh. Or maybe it was, you know. Or maybe it was just a friend's house, you know. So at some points, you know, homeless. You know? How many times did you move around? How many times did you do this? I'd say switching? we did about 16, 16 moves. 16 moves? 16, yeah, 16 yeah, By moves. the time you were how old? Uh, high school, yeah. So uh, by 18, I'd say we moved about 16 times. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, I, it's I almost know. Almost once a year. Yeah, well, one time we moved three in one year, so yeah. And, and what, what was lead? Obviously, there's uh, decisions or like actions that you're taking that's going to lead you to, to becoming evicted, right? What what do you think? I didn't even understand it, man. I didn't, you didn't even know. Yeah, yeah but now looking back, yeah, what do you think? Dude, I just, I just see, I just think it's sad, man. I think it's sad. Honestly, I, I had a lot of. Hatred towards my mom because of what happened um, to my brother, and I and that hatred, it really fueled me, man. I and, and now I don't have hatred towards her anymore. I'm sad by the whole situation, and I'm I'm, I'm sad at uh, the fact that you know my my family had to perish for that. Uh, my immediate family, yeah. I mean, my other family is they're doing well. That's great. That's great to hear, man. Well, obviously, that your 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 family now is doing well. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, yeah. tragedy, I guess, in your family. Uh, but but we'll we'll get to that later. So so you you were talking about like these um, these different men that was they used to come in yeah. and out of your mother's house. What was what was that like as a as a young boy? Especially, are you the oldest? You're the oldest. I'm the one. oldest. So I was like a I was like a I was like the man of the house. Yeah. Not really the man of the house. Yeah, exactly. She would ask me my pr approval. It was a weird, I had a very, very weird, especially when my brother was born, you know, I almost was like his second father. You know, I was, uh, she had to work night shifts. So she'd be like, hey, John, you know, um, I have to go to work. And I'd be like, yeah. And she goes, yeah, I'm going to work the night shift and you're going to make sure Tommy's okay. He's sleeping and if he need to change his diaper, you know, all the stuff's here. And if he's, you know, thirsty, give him a Kool-Aid twist. You know, because you like these fucking Kool-Aid drinks, you know, those red ones and whatnot. Uh, no, I don't think, I, we're not really familiar with Kool-Aid here. Yeah. It's like a, it's, it's like, it's like, water like, and like sugary shit. Yeah, like those, uh, orzata. We had orzata, in. exactly. Yeah, and, and, so this is like a strawberry and it's a kiwi one. I mean, I think my brother drank so many of these fucking things mm. that one time he shit infrared green. <laughs> <laughs> like it was... He had he had green shit one day, and then one time he had red shit. You know, like holy crap! You know, like one time I thought he was bleeding from his asshole, but he wasn't. It was just this drink. <laughs> and uh, how old was he when he was consuming all of these uh, uh, Kool Aid? Man, dude, our diets were McDonald's. Okay, <laughs> okay. And I was eating. Sometimes we'd have peanut butter, and that was great, you know. But then we didn't have bread, so we just put peanut butter on a spoon and eat it. You know, that would be my breakfast. You know, shit or cereal you know a lot of cereal never home cooked meals my mom didn't cook you know she was she was good she could cook uh -huh. but she only cooked for thanksgiving you know so we would eat mcdonald's it's because she was uh, but she sounded like she was super busy as well no no just because she didn't like cooking okay and i have like a, a fetish if i see dishes in the sink uh -huh. like i have to immediately clean them because when I was growing up, it was like I'd see a mountain of dishes. Like I didn't even know where it came from. Because most of the time, we'd eat like TV dinners, you know. 
she would be like a professional. Oh, John, you have to poke holes by the mashed potato so that it steams. <laughs> so it became like a professional, uh, you call it microwaving king. I was I was a king <laughs> of microwaves. I could definitely do Bone it. Bone is like, why don't you invite him home to do your dishes? Because I'm yeah. always bitching about the dishes. Yeah. For sure, because that's my that's my role at home. Yeah. And for sure, once nice. this podcast is done, it's, good. And it's like midnight and I'm, I'm home. You can say, I John, John has to come over the house. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we should finish this conversation back at my place. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, and I'll wash your plates. <laughs> that sounded terribly... Uh, <laughs> Butterfly college. Yeah, doesn't, doesn't sound right. Yeah. Um, cool. But by the way... Swedish meatballs mm-hmm. was my favorite. Out of all the uh, TV dinners, out of all the TV dinners, man, the Swedish meatballs. Okay, so again, like TV Definitely dinners better. wasn't like a, as big a thing in Malta as it, as it probably was in the it's states. Like, it's like a box. Yeah, yeah. You'd have like a plastic tray, and yeah. then it would be like a cling film on it. And you had to poke the holes for the uh, potatoes, but everything else you just leave it as is. Put it in there five minutes in the microwave, ding, ready to serve. It, tasty. I haven't had one in a while, but I think so. I ate it. It sounds, at least it sounds a bit more nutritious than uh, McDonald's, no? Oh, McDonald's, man. Dollar menu. Always a dollar menu. I, I'll be like, one time I told my mom for a Big Mac, she's like, dollar menu. <laughs> okay, dollar menu. Oh, good. Um, so, uh, yeah. So you went to uh, high school, and that's, is, is it, was it in high school that you uh, kind of, uh, encountered gymnastics for the first uh, time? No, the first time, the the legit first time that I actually really wanted to be a gymnast was um, when I was playing on the handball court. And I, you probably don't know what handball is. No, but, the handball we get. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Not handball, no, not the European handball, man. We have another form of handball. So our okay. handball is like a ghetto kid uh, activity where you have a wall okay. and you have a rubber ball, like a, one of those... Um, the one that Rocky used to have when he used to bounce it on the he used to bounce it on the floor, like and a rubber, that like rubber, a bit like hard. Uh, yeah, it was a rubber ball. Yeah, not super hard, but like just ball. almost like a squash ball. Okay. Yeah, so you take this ball and you have to whack it with your hand to hit the wall, well, uh, and then it could only bounce once, once and, and then, then the other guy has to hit it. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we used to play that. We used to call it squash. We used to call it squash. But with your hand or with a paddle? No, no, with our hand oh, with at hand. school. Okay. Uh, yep. And the way with it was like you we, you could be like a, like a group of 20 sometimes. Yeah, And you're exactly. like, yep. uh, uh, John Spartan, bah. and then you hit it and you go, Mark, and then Mark has to hit it. And like yeah. everyone's, okay. and then obviously. And if you miss, you're then out. We, then we played this game where, you know, a little bit more brutal is that somebody used to bring a, ba- a baseball uh, and then we used to play, it's called asses up. Mm. And if you got, uh, you know, you know the, the letters to to spell asses up, you had to go to the wall, and the guy who got you out could take that baseball and throw it at your ass, <laughs> and peg you with it. Yeah, man, and you just uh, you did take the. So first you play like this. Uh, yeah, because handball, and yeah. then whoever gets kicked out enough times to spell asses out. Yeah, he has to like get, go up to the wall and just get maimed. Oh, well. Because we didn't have money to go bet. So what else do you have then to throw a ball at someone's yeah. ass? You know? Gambled Free. with pain. Gambled with pain. Gambled with pain is always... Yeah. Uh, it's always a legitimate option, I think, with uh, <laughs> young boys. <laughs> I think all the people from Brooklyn will be like, yeah, we used to play that game. Yeah, we never played asses up. We did like uh, British Bulldogs. That was That was cool. British I, bulldogs. I, know, I know what a British bulldog is. Not the dog. No, like uh, so, like you get like they say it's a team of twenty. Okay. And like ten stand on one side and ten stand on the other side of let's say a, a bas- basketball pitch or a football okay. pitch. And then we have to like the guys on this side need to tr- get to the other side and get over the line that the other the, the other team. Is yeah, defending. this is not the same thing. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. They touch them, yeah. To yeah, get no, them but they out. don't touch you. No, no. In order to get you out, they have to like it started out where you have to touch the person. Yeah, and obviously then people are going like, "Ah, oh, you didn't touch me," and I went. So then we kind of like had to escalate to DefCon one yeah. eventually. We where you could we, tackle them. We have to like pick them up and like body slam them. Oh, like, that it's sounds like, like my WWF. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Total, awesome. totally your game, bro. Yeah, another thing. Yeah, we yeah lo- I, I grew up on WWF. I loved it. Same. If I watched Same. TV, it was like, oh man, I loved Hulk Hogan. Same. Uh, Macho Man, Randy Savage. Same. I mean, awesome. Dude, but that, I, I, Ultimate I, I, Warrior was my favorite, though. Was he? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think. Well, uh, no. So my favorite was Hulk Hogan. 
for sure. And I grew up wanting to be Hulk Hogan. Of Hulkamania. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. he was just like, like such a badass. And at the same time, like even as a kid, mm. uh, you understand that this guy has values. And even though he's selling you a bullshit story, because later, I mean, you learned that Hulk That's Hogan. That's probably why I didn't like him. Because he gave you this he had like, values. Because uh, he had <laughs> Uh, Hulk's gonna listen to this and say, "Fuck this guy, man." Yeah, if Hulk's listening, man, uh, it's an open invitation, bro. I like him now. I like you now, Hulk. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and uh, he was just like I think the the ultimate hero, you know, like he was. badass, but yeah. at the same time, like he's like hugging kids and yeah. he's walking out there and talking about like. Like in selling the whole American dream at the time, which was like a really big thing. Yeah. If uh, Trump could be a wrestler, it would have been him because no, he was carrying no. the American flag no, no, out. He'd be, he'd be, you know who he'd be? Uh, he'd be like... Uh, like Ronald uh, Reagan? The, the, the Million Dollar Man. Oh remember, my God. Remember Jesus the Million Dollar Man? Christ. Yes. Ted DiBiase, was that his He name? was the asshole everybody hated. Yeah. yeah, yeah oh, yeah, that yeah. would be Trump. All right, that, cool. that would probably be Trump. Because, uh, yeah, because like the Patriots were still... Very coming off as very empathetic and right, generous. Right, right, right. Yeah. Whereas Trump is like you know, uh, yeah. he's very brash and and oh, uh, very not 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 really caring too much about the vulnerable. But but Hulk Hogan was like, I'm tough. I can body slam you know 500 pound giant. Uh, Everyone in, in, uh, uh, was that WrestleMania three when he, he body slammed. He took the giant when he took the giant and he Andre Andre, Andre the, the giant. giant. Yeah, but at the same time, I care about kids. I care about, you know, all the, the good shit in life. Trump's not that. No, um, probably I not. Guess. Uh, so where were we at? Gymnastics. So how did you get into... Yeah, so I went down to the handball court, and uh, there was these guys, and they were doing breakdancing, and the guy busts out a backflip. And I was like, holy shit, man, that's awesome. How'd you do that? And the guy uh, said to me, ah, it's easy. You just jump up in the air, and you grab your legs. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> Yeah. And everybody knew me as being that daredevil guy, you know, that guy that just uh, does stupid shit, uh -huh. you know? So I was like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm going to do that then. And uh, just to help myself out, I said, I'm not going to start on the ground. I'm going to start off a fire hydrant. So I decided to do the flip. And obviously I didn't end up well because I got, you know, uh, I think I got 12 stitches in my head because I smashed my head into this fucking fire hydrant. And remember what I said about my mom saying, do whatever you want and I'm cool with it? Yeah. Yeah, until I s smashed my head open. Then that was a problem because then uh, she came down. What the fuck are you doing? I, got, I remember vividly, you know, just my mom screaming and yelling and I'm um, being rushed in the car, you know, just like driving fast. And then um, I got maybe to the hospital, but I don't really remember it because I think I passed out. And all I remember is I wake up and I hear my mom talking to my grandmother and she goes, I don't know what I'm going to fucking do with this kid. And my grandmother goes, it's simple, Rita. Put him in gymnastics. Mm. And then it started. So I had to crack my skull open to start gymnastics. And uh, how did that progress? Uh, I, I, I went to a club, um, from school, not, not a private club. Cause that's, you know, for kids that have money. So I, what, I what was school. the school like? This one was good. Yeah. So my grandma had me at this time and, um, I was at the school and the school was nice. You know, they were all, uh, it's like moving from Bormla to Slima. Okay. And I was like looking around going, Oh man, look at all these pussies, you know? Because I came from a school where I was the minority. You know, like when I was in Brooklyn, you know, I was that one white kid in school. And I was, you know, surrounded by black guys that were just looking at me like, yo, man, going to see you in the hallways. <laughs> you know? And you had, to, you had to fight for your right there, you know? So there would be wait days where, you know, you just get caught in a ring of, you know, just battling it out, you know? Bumping heads. And then when I came to this school, it was like everybody holding hands, you know? So it was weird. You know, you, 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 you went from one extreme to another extreme. And then I saw kids that were, you know, doing things that I couldn't even dream of doing, you know? So I was like, wow, this guy's doing, you know, gymnastics. Hmm. And uh, it turned out that, you know, the coach of the gymnastics team said that I had potential. I joined the team and, um, you know, I became the, uh, when I was in eighth grade, so I was young still, 
um, he said that I, that, you know, I could be the captain of the team. You know, eighth grade is how old? Uh, I'd say it's about 12, 13. Dude, I don't even remember. So I'm going to sound like an Generally, asshole. what does that? I would say teenager. Oh, uh, young. Early young teenager. teens. Early teens, yeah. Early teens. And I said... Uh, uh, what? What? Uh, why do you think the coach said that you'd be... Uh, you had potential? What? I just learned shit fast. Okay. You know, uh, it just came quick. I was like, bam, back handspring. I learned it. You know, it took me... I mean, as a coach in gymnastics, I've coached gymnastics for nearly 25 years. It's incredible how many kids that I've actually taught gymnastics. And there's only like maybe two kids that I've ever came across that probably learned a back handspring as fast as I did. I just had a lot of determination, you know, um, to learn a back handspring. All right, I was afraid what, of- What's like, a back handspring? It's when you're standing on the ground and you throw yourself back to your hands and you flip over, but okay. you land on your hands. Okay. And literally not knowing that move, you are afraid. And I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm just afraid of breaking my neck. So what did I do? I took a panel mat and I took another mat and I said, I'm going to do it on this mat and I'm just going to keep going and going and going. And they said, John, you know, usually people spot you for this, you know, this movement. And you don't use these thick mats. You go on a lighter mat. And I said, yeah, but the coach isn't here to spot me. I want to continue to do it on my own. Because I want to just keep on making the move, making the move, making the move. And they said, but it's going to be impossible for you to throw a back handspring on this mat. And I said, no, it's not. I will do one on this mat. And when I do it on the mat and I feel comfortable, I'm going to go on the small mat that you go on, and I'm going to do a back handspring. And what makes the thicker mat? Because uh... when you jump, you, you absorb all your energy into the mat. So you're not really getting that full jump. So nah, it's, it's like way squatting harder. on a cushion kind of. No, it's like jumping in the sand. Oh, okay, ah, so it's far harder. Far harder. Yeah. Okay. So they were like laughing at me, going, "John, you, you're counterproductive. You need to have somebody spot you." And you, I said, "Yeah, but the I'm difference is then after way. you've been, let's say, running in the sand for an afternoon, and then you run in the tarmac. It's like that's the point. Is that when like I so threw late. it and I got comfortable on that mat and I did a back handspring, I would always land on my head. I was landing on my head. I was landing on my head. I was landing on my head. So the fear just just started to diminish. Where I was like. Okay, I've been landing on my head, and I threw this thing a million times. And I said, okay, a million and one, it clicked. And I said, oh, shit, now I'm going to go onto the floor. Mm -hmm. When I learned the back handspring, the coaches were all like, well, dude, I only, I only showed it to you once. And, and how long did it take you uh, to, to learn master a back handspring? the move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, master it? No. Not master, it. but, but like, get it uh, on my own. Get it on my own. Do it by yourself, yeah. Yeah, three days. Three days. And yeah. it was the. Some kids do private lessons. For years and don't learn it. Well, okay. It right. depends on the individual. So, and do you uh, do you think that's just like your uh, natural uh, athletic ability, or the fact that you're just like uh, very hard headed? Kind yeah. of like a bit like your mom, no? Like your mom, <sighs> yeah, uh, dude. Well, I'm a thick headed <laughs> person, man, dude. I've been told that a minute too many times, dude. We're similar in many ways. Are you tougher physically or mentally? I don't know. I think I'm balanced. Yeah, for certain things, I'm weak. And for some things, I'm strong. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I'm not strong on everything. I, I think that anyone that says that they, they have no weakness, I think they're lying. Yeah, and yeah. They're, they're hiding something. Yeah, for sure. You for know? sure. And I sure. have nothing to hide. You know? And I think it's a feedback loop. I think, I think that's the, the people that I know that are kind of like the, the, the toughest physically yeah. generally have like a really uh, like tight mindset right. that just like feeds feeds them at the point of, of crisis or at the point where most people would break up because break right. down because uh, physically they can't endure anymore. Right. The, that's when their mind shifts in and it's no longer like a, a muscular uh, endeavor, but it's now kind of like transcended all fatigue, all, all explosive energy. You're just like going through the motions uh, kind of like uh, on some other fuel that's not... Uh, that's not your muscles. That's that's like beast mode. Yeah. Honestly, that's a thing. You know, some people say, "Oh, yeah," they laugh. They say, "Oh, beast mode is just a saying." Uh, I think beast mode is like when you're when you're so focused, you're laser focused on just that thing. Yeah. That's why when some you know, not to call out any yoga people, but you know what I hate about yoga? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. I it's not the stretching, man. I, it's not, I only hate stretching, man. Yoga people, they preach that mm. they say. But yoga is meditation, and you 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 become one with your body. Mm. I go okay. Well, I mean, 
the fitness that I deliver is is, is meditation as well. It's mm -hmm. our meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, if we're grunting out reps on the deadlift bar, right? there's nothing else that I'm thinking about. That's why I like yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. If I'm running long distance, like uh, let's say we're running 10K together, I mean, I can think about my whole fucking day. Yeah. You know, I can think of a, a million other things I'd rather do. When I'm deadlifting and I'm going for a PR, you know, I'm like, oh shit, There's man, I got 200 else. kilos on the yeah. bar, man. I'm just looking at the bar going, shit, man, that's gotta go up, it's gotta go down, and that's the end of it. Yeah. There's no other thought yeah. in my mind except for completing the rep. Yeah, yeah. In fact, a lot yeah. of kids, because I have ADHD and, and it's a thing that people know, yeah. uh, so so uh, parents come to me with their kids sometimes to ask me like uh, how I deal with it. And one of the one of the best tools for, for yeah. dealing with ADHD is, in fact, the deadlift in particular uh, or the right. squat. Um, and especially like in uh, low reps and high, high intensity because yeah. there's nothing in the world you could possibly, in the moment, you, uh, half a thought comes into your mind when you're squatting no. and you're going for a PR. The moment you get half a thought, you're sitting on your ass. True. You're, you're like gone. Yeah. Um, and that really teaches, teaches you um, how to focus on one thing at a time because it puts right. you in a crisis position. And then once you learn that you are able to do that, uh, then you can repeat that, uh, that kind of like uh, brain configuration um, in other things where it's not crises. But since you've mm -hmm. seen yourself do it, yeah, it's, uh, it then becomes replicable. Awesome, man. Uh, Bone is asking the fuck is a PR. PR is a personal record. That's a personal record, yeah. PR is a personal record. And what's, what's, what's cool about the deadlift as well, I call that one the, the queen of bodybuilding movements or the, the compound movements. And then you have the king is the back squat, yeah? Um, the thing about the deadlift is that when you're doing a deadlift, you're recruiting every muscle in your body. Yeah. I mean, if you're lifting heavy enough, I feel like your eyeballs are fucking wet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like you, you feel in your shit, eyes, you're like, shit. they open up. Um, I can only compare it, honestly, when you're, when you're hitting a heavy, heavy deadlift, I can compare it to skydiving. Okay. I went skydiving and I was like, holy crap, man, this is fucking amazing. You know, any drug on the planet. It can't, it can't get you there. Well, wow. jumping out of a plane is fantastic. So I definitely recommend it to anyone that wants to fucking go above and beyond. Skydiving or deadlifts or both, or deadlift while fucking skydiving. both. Do deadlifts and skydive at the same that's, time. That's it. That's the, that's my secret to life. <laughs> deadlifts and skydiving. End of podcast. That's See you it. next week. That's done, guys. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> so so the, so you uh, so now you're captaining the high school. No, 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 no. So the middle school. Middle school, okay. Yeah, middle school one. Yeah. And then uh, I left and went back to the city. And, you know, I kind of fucked off on that. So then went back to being a douche. Cool. I just realized uh, that I've picked up your fucking American accent, bro. I think so. Yeah. Well, throughout, I think I've been talking fucking American and I'm from Mostar. So That's I okay. don't know the fuck this up hey, with that. But I think I'm going to... Thug life. Yeah. I missed you. How do you know this shit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we used to have all this shit because we used, we grew up like listening to hip hop. And, and You're right. Okay, I'm going to uh, try and get uh, my true, fucking true. Maltese English. I forgot about that. I forgot about that. So we used to have all our shit like uh, Mostafornia right. uh, and the guys in Bricker Car were like yeah. Bricker Car Ronks. Right. And that was like our way of uh, emulating the Americans. Yeah. yeah. Like our hood was... Uh, that basically. So we actually did have MST. If you go around Mostar, you will see a whole bunch so of what was MST. So what was your first tape? Uh, first tape was tape. Give, it was given to me by okay. my sister, okay. Noel. Okay. What's up? And it was uh, on one side, uh, Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. Nice. Staten Island. Wu-Tang Clan. Wu-Tang Clan. Anyway. Man. And in fact, I had planned to wear my Wu-Tang t-shirt today, but I, that I, been I awesome. fucked it up. I fucked it up. Uh, since you said you're from New York. Oh and, um, the, and on the other side was Cypress Hill, yeah. but I forgot the name of the album. I think Unreleased and Revamped, which okay. was the one that started with... Uh, Insane the Membrane? No, it started with... like The first song was Them and the Fugees. And uh, it was called uh, Boom Bidi Bye Bye. I, yeah. I Boom Bidi Bye Bye. Oh, man. Open up your eyes, you'll be the next yeah. one to die. I loved, I really. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, my uh, my youth was yeah. beautifully spoiled by hip hop. Nice. Yeah. Oh, even mine, man. I mean, my first my first cassette tape that I ever had, yeah. um, you had to bring a blank. 
and you bring it to the guy on the block. So I don't even know his name. He was just the guy on the block. Mm. And he was like, what song do you want? Because he'd have <laughs> fucking tons of tapes, yeah? And I was like uh, obsessed with LL Cool J's. Um, Mama said, knock it out. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I'd like that song. And he goes, 50 cents a song. <laughs> 50 cents. Gave him 50 cents. He recorded it, you know, played it on one. Hit the record button, bam! That was it. I had my mama said knock you out. Wow! First would, CD, Vanilla Ice, which I can still do in karaoke. Oh, yeah, which I, is terrible. I mean, is, it's, yeah. it's almost a shameful thing. I don't to know. Say, I think we're gonna have to. Uh, yeah, yeah. I no, I can to, sing it. Please don't. No, definitely won't. <laughs> we're gonna yep. we'll pass on that. Uh, <laughs> no, we had the most that we had. This place called Black Toe. Interested my heart too. Sure, Black Toe. Black Toe was uh, when well, you get frostbite. Uh, yeah, Black Toe's when you get frostbite, but also it was this guy who was like a, a weddings mobile DJ, oh, but wow. he had a shop in cool. Mostar, and you used to go to him with a list. Uh, oh, wow. It wasn't as near as dodgy as you. He used to just oh, like turn totally up dodgy. with a list, and somehow he had access to all the songs, and then he used to feel himself to be somewhat of a curator, so if you said like you wanted... Uh, I don't know Method Man uh, Bring the Pain and he didn't have that and he'd be like uh, I didn't have that so instead I gave you something really fucked up like uh, I don't know <laughs> U2 or, or 2 Unlimited U2 is not that two fucked up unlimited. 2 Unlimited like they're, they're oh, they man. have a black guy in there and I think yeah. she's half black so and I think it's like not even this. it's not even nearly close no it's yeah. like uh, no, no no limits can reach for the sky oh man but I she remember. was fit huh? she was alright that's Jared. probably that's probably the only thing that was good about the band then. Yeah. yeah. If you yeah, could yeah, even yeah. call that a band, that was yeah, a yeah. Like and when the music. song stopped was amazing as well. Like right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Shamefully I, I, I have listened to these things. Yes. So I went through my phases. I've uh, I've went through even like almost like a like a gothic like uh, look. A goth phase, yeah. It you wasn't don't, gothic. Yeah. You know what it was? I, dude, I don't even know what it was. I, I used to wear Jenkos. What? Jenko pants, man. They were like Jenko pants. Okay. You know what Bones bell bottoms are? Jenko. Yes. D these things were like fucking pipe pants. Okay. So bell bottoms are tight at the top, mm -hmm. and then they flare out. Okay. Jenkos are just oh, one fuck. big see that fucking. The, that's a Jenko. <laughs> that's a fucking Jenko. Walk man. around with that, <laughs> dude. <laughs> and I used to walk around with a part in the middle of my head. Okay. Right, because John Connor had it from uh, from Terminator. You remember John oh. Connor? <laughs> so I thought that that was a cool haircut. So John my Connor mom the, the, did the, the haircut child? for me. The child? The child. Okay. So my mom did her version of what John Connor looks like. And I walked around school getting called pussyhead because it looked like an 80s vagina, apparently. <laughs> a lady's vagina? Oh, 80s, 80s. Uh, well, uh, how, how does an 80s vagina differ from a lady? With hair. Man? With hair. Ah, okay. Full on. Yeah, because that fell out of... Um, a yeah. lot of fashion, right? Is it back in fashion? I, I don't think. Or is the bush maybe back? Mid, maybe minimal hair, like maybe the landing strip. Yeah, yeah, like a like a little a line, or, maybe or, with an arrow. Uh, yeah, or you could put like initials, like, in, or like a like a floral design. Christmas, Christmas tree. Yeah, if, you can do these things. Uh, it has to be just grunge, not full on hair. Yes, it has to have a uh, purpose. But my hair, my hair looked like a full on bush. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty bad. All right. And I think I look better now. No, I know. Well, if I had a picture, man, you'd be like, Hold yeah, yeah, you, you should send us a picture. And we can get like a small insert and uh, no. bo bone is, bo what's, what's up, bone? Move on. <laughs> <laughs> bone, bone, bone doesn't like talking about vaginas for some reason. I don't know. Why is that, bone? Why do <laughs> vaginas make you uncomfortable? Okay, bone's not replying. Okay. Um, so, uh, gymnastics. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so you didn't have like, because you were obviously evidently like a street kid, and like when you see gymnasts, obviously yeah. like, this is not me shitting on gymnasts, because gymnasts are like the most incredibly strong people I know. Oh, I know up. what you're going to say. I know what like you're going to say whole, before you said it. Ready? You're going to say, but aren't they kind of... Sorry? Aren't they kind of ladylike? I was going to say leotard. But yeah, yeah, leotard. Yeah, I'm, uh, that also gets coupled with a couple of choice words that we can't say anymore. No, we, uh, we yeah. will refrain. Yeah. From so, so with that being said, the wrestlers used to say shit like that. And I would say, but you're in a singlet, man. Yeah. At least I put on pants. But at least it's two men 
Like with the with the wrestling each other. <laughs> that sounds a <laughs> little bit. If you put it that way, you know, I I said, dude. I mean, uh, honestly, I'm I'm on my own on the floor. I'm on my own on the parallel bars. I'm on my own on the high bar. You guys are together in a Hugging. singlet. Yeah. So what are you talking about, mate? Yeah, and I guess that's why. Like uh, Roman Greco wrestling is probably not that popular, and why like that? And you know what they do in Rome more. back in those days? Yeah, yeah, they were Roman. All they kinds were, they of were Roman, all kinds of things. Areas. Yeah. yeah, maybe that's why wrestling was popular back then. Okay. Now, yeah. now it's BJJ, yeah. So BJJ Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, yeah. I mean, uh, nobody talks about wrestling anymore. True, but apparently, uh, like if a wrestler starts uh, doing BJJ, apparently it's like the ultimate weapon. Yeah. Well, he is different. He's got a different weapon. You know, that he's... Uh, Bones like BJJ, question mark, question mark, question mark. Bro, it's all me and Mark fucking talk about. Jiu -jitsu, yeah. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You got to get with the program, man. Yes, I know. From gymnastics, from one sport to another. So, okay, back to gymnastics and back, back to... to gymnastics. So you didn't get any of this, like, I'm not wearing a leotard shit. No. Uh, yeah, I did. I got it. I got it. In fact, I got two different things. So when I went from the hard school to the light school, the hard school, they didn't talk shit about you. They didn't make fun of you. Mm -hmm. You know, they just came up to you and were like, yo, we're gonna fucking throw down. The light school was all like, well, let's make fun of people. Yeah. You know, so my real last name, I'm not Spartan, by the way. Uh, my real last name is Cogswell. Okay. Um, I, I created this name, not to be harder or anything, but given the fact of my family and, and what had happened uh, it's not that I didn't feel comfortable. I said, okay, I'm going to be a personal trainer. I'm going to, you know, just put out something that's, you know, more unique to that. And, you know, my name doesn't need to be out there. I don't need to uh, throw out my actual name. It's not that I'm not, I'm ashamed of it. At one point I was, you know, and maybe that was me hiding, you know, who I was. But uh, I'm not afraid to tell people who I am. My, my name is really Cogswell. And I got a lot of shit for that fucking name. Why? Man, they just they they found ways to like twist my fucking name. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, so instead of Cogswell, then it was um, Coxwell. Yeah, and and actually, Bone just wrote, yeah. wrote the top one. It's probably he's like it's probably yeah. Coxwell. So but then I would Coxwell like a porn star name. So yeah, like, yeah. So, like I know John John yeah. Coxwell. Isn't that like so he's I used really to, I, good at yeah. So I used to actually you know spin it around, and that was good because I used to say yeah, my cock swelling in your mom. <laughs> You know, and that would, and then, and then we fight. You know, yeah. and that was okay with me because I was okay with fighting. Uh, um, but then they became more creative with my name, and then I couldn't get away from it. And this was the ultimate, and it killed me. They called me Cock Smell. <laughs> and I was like, Fuck. <laughs> well, now, now I'm fucked. There's no real way around this one. When that circulated, I was like, oh well, um, yeah. What do you do? Yeah. Now you have to say. Uh, you know, that's when my grandmother had that saying, you know, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words, they'll never hurt you. And I was like, yeah, but I want to fucking kill them. And she was like, no, John, you have to be justified in what you do. Now, if they touch you, it's a different story. And then I'll back you all the way. So I'd always make them touch me. So I found a way to do that. I'd be like, oh, if I'm a cock smell, why don't you put your hands on me, boy? And then they put their hands on me and then I had the justification. It could be even a finger tap. My grandmother said, if somebody touches you and you don't like it, it's okay. It's they put their hands on you first. Yeah. So it always, so always get in the face and be like, what you going to do, boy? Yeah, and if it, 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 like they're going to push you or something. Oh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, you just do that with your hands behind your back. Even, if they're, give it to even if they're concerned that you're going to attack them, they're going to be like, hey. Sometimes they back hey, down, yeah. yeah. Or they just walk away and call me a cock smell again. All right, man. Uh, we'll, be right, we'll be right back. In Maltese, we say which I've never really understood, obviously because I haven't seen many penises, but I don't think mine, I don't think mine had a thread. I don't remember, you know, talhaita means like uh, cutting the thread, right? I don't know. If any, has anyone in this room experienced talhaita? A friend of mine. A friend of yours? Bloody. Yeah? Yes. What were you doing there? Okay. So what are we talking about right now? So, 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 so uh, in, Maltese, we, in Maltese, we say when, you, when you're a guy. Yeah. It's called cut the thread. Ta -ta okay. That's when you lose your virginity. Apparently, there's a thread that cuts. No, yeah? Not with virginity. Dude, I, not I, with virginity. It just happened at later on. Julian, isn't it? I think, I think. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> no, no, like actually, title height, huh? 
Le mataf mean? I think in America we have another saying for this. Yeah, which is she broke my fucking dick. So, uh, somehow we keep going from gymnastics. To yeah. Pussy, so hair, finishing. Now cocks so and, so uh, finishing. No. So finishing up gymnastics. Mm-hmm. Um, I I went back to Long Island, and I was in uh, Ronkonkoma, which is um, Sachem, and I actually spent three years there. Was that uh, Sachem High School? This is a high school that I actually graduated from, and mm. you know that that was the end of my schooling of you know. Uh, regular school. I got out at 18. Um, then I joined the military. So in that school, I rejoined gymnastics and that's when I took it to the level. You know, my first year on the team, I, I, I got the coach's award for, you know, just improving every single day. I would just constantly work on the movements, you know? And when you say working on the movements, literally, you know, being as good as I was on parallel bars, I hold it to, you know, this little TV I had. I used to flip it upside down because I had, like, one of those, like, little shit box TVs, you know, just a little one. I used to put it upside down. And I, wa- I used to watch cartoon, um, uh, my, my, my regular, like, cartoons or whatever, you know, kids are like, watching. And when it used to go into commercial break, I used to hold a handstand and watch the commercials upside down. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. And that was just like your uh, yeah, I hated routinely? Com- no, because I hated commercials. Okay. And I used to walk out of the room and then I missed my show. So to not hate commercials anymore, I used to go, oh, I want to watch them upside down. You gave it a function to I said, improve. you know, yeah, because commercials were roughly about five minutes. Okay. So I used to hold that shit. And man, dude, nobody could beat me in a handstand competition. It was like... There's nobody beating me in that. And how how important was your uh, gymnastic training to where you are physically today? I'd say it, it molded it molded a lot of who I am as a coach. I, even my coach did. He's a little bit more brutal than I am. So I mean, dude, if you think I'm brutal, Ken Freeheim, he's the real he's a real brutal dude, man. It doesn't get more brutal than that guy. What what's uh, what's up with with Ken Freeheim? Ken Freeheim, yeah, yeah, he expected 100%, and if you didn't give it to him, he'd just go, okay, I'm going to go look at the next guy now. Which meant what? Well, he'd say, fuck you, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not performing, you're not doing it, then I go to the guy that's going to perform. He's like, show me something, if you got it, you got it. You're going to give me excuses, I'm going to go to the next guy. So you always gave, he always gave everybody their chance. He'll walk up to you and he'll say, what, what are we working on? We're going to work on this. Okay, great. All right. Let's you, see it. You're working on it. Let me see it. He'd say, okay, you got to fix this and this. If you did it and you did it wrong, he would say it again. I would need you to pop out of that back handspring and you need to straighten out for that layout. If I didn't do it on the second time, it was like, okay, see you later. He'd walk away. And if he walked away from you, you knew you fucked up and you were like, okay, listen, I'm not wasting my time. How big of an influence was this guy? Because all throughout, like now like, or like now or like then, dad now or then, yeah, my my dad, oh, my, dad my dad abandoned my mom, so my mom had to make a serious choice yeah. uh, to either have me or abort me because he wanted he wanted my mom to abort me. So. We'll, we'll get to her dad in yeah. a bit, just cause, so because we keep losing the train of thought on the gymnastics. Let's let's get the gymnastics down. Uh, and this Ken guy was he a bit like a father figure or an older brother or how did you how did you perceive him at so, what like sixteen? Yeah, I'm 16. Um, how did I perceive him? I perceived him as... Uh, They're telling me was, my hair's was, fucked up. My hair's fucked up? He was... Uh, no, my hair's okay. He was, um, he was like a god. A god? A god. So like a... Yeah, you came there and it was like you, you pay homage to this guy. Why? That's how he rolled, man. I mean, he was an untouchable dude. He was an old man. Um, he how had his tenure, so, you know, he, he was... Dude, nobody could touch him. How old, how old was this guy? Uh, at the time, I think he was probably early 70s. Early 70s, and uh, and he was still, sounds like feared? Feared, man. He was feared at 70 no, years he old. Just, so he uh, he like, looked like a salty seaman. He just looked like a, he had those wrinkle lines, man. He just look at you, and if he, he squinched like this, he'd turn into like one big wrinkle. <laughs> and you just look at him, and you just be like, oh my God, this guy. And what was your relationship with uh, God like? And he chew his like? gum like this. All right, gentlemen. Even that, that, that sound, it just brings goosebumps from my head. You know what I'm saying? 
So I was like, uh, it's like, let's get to work. And it's like, all right. And he said, let's get to work. That means, all right. So that means we got to set up the gym. You had to set up the gym. You had to roll out the floor, you know, because half the gymnasium uh -huh. was being taken over by equipment. The other half has to be for the gym. Okay. So we had to pack up and roll out every single day. And man, did we do it efficiently as a team. Always rolled out the mat. Always set up the bars, and we just were a group. It, it just sounds like uh, it's, it just sounds like a group where a lot of people, like with a big turnover of people, where like people are coming in and out because like they don't, <laughs> like people can't hack it. Some people were, yeah, there were a lot of in and outs. There, but no, he didn't do that either. Listen, if somebody, how do you get into uh, uh, what's his name, Ken? Ken Freon. Ken, Ken, how yeah. do you get into Ken's group? Yeah. Is that like the team, uh, the high school team, or? Well, how I got in was uh, I came up to, I came up to a teacher, and I said, "Wow, I want to, I want to do this," and she's like, "Oh, well, you know, it's season now, so they're trying out." I came up to Ken, and um, Ken looked at me and uh, said, "What you want?" And I said, "Oh, I'd like to, you know, start this." He goes. You know what you're doing? And I said, uh, I did a little bit of gymnastics in another school. He goes, all right, come down tomorrow. And gave me a time. I came down there. And then he said, uh, did, I didn't know shit. <laughs> and I had a lot of work. But you'll be on the team, uh, but not on the team. And I was like, the fuck does that mean? <laughs> so what that meant was, um, the gymnasts that are good, they compete and yeah. they represent the, the the school. The school, and if you're not good, you kind of like <laughs> in the bleachers, like. But you're allowed to train. Holding <laughs> sign saying "Do good." <laughs> so I was one of those guys for the first year. But you are allowed to practice with these guys. Hundred percent, yes. Yeah, Which is yeah. vital if you want to become vital, man. In that first year, and was he like a? Like, like, how many people were actually not that good, but still came to training, and Ken was still allowing them to train, and he was still training? Oh, I would say 80% of the people. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you had, uh, like, your infantrymen, and then you had your Navy SEAL team. Okay. And, and the, the SEAL uh, team was the one that was putting the points up. Yeah. And, but and these like, guys of the infantry, uh, infantry guys, the, these guys set the tone. So in the beginning, you'd have your not-so-good guys, and then you end with your best guys. Okay. So if the guys that aren't so good are good, they're setting the tone and, and, and the scoring process for the judges. So if you can get those not so good guys uh -huh. or are giving the points up, mm -hmm. your next guy is getting a higher point. You know, it just, it worked better as if everybody was good to some degree and it progressively got better. So, so what made this Ken brutal? Because you right. said he was like full on. Okay, so, you know, strength training sessions were brutal. Uh, the training, he wasn't brutalizing. He'll yell. He would yell at you, but that was almost like a joke. John, John. Sometimes he'd call me John. And I think he's calling my buddy because my best friend was Sean. So I'd always think he's calling fucking Sean, man. So I wouldn't answer him. And he'd always come up like, ah, fuck. And I'm like, oh, you calling Sean or John, man? Yeah, so, uh, so I didn't get that. But, he, you know, everybody would laugh. That was like the joking area, you know? And uh, we always trained to the oldies. So, like, you know, Frank Sinatra, I mean, crazy shit, man. We didn't even listen to rock or rap. No, man. It was oldies or nothing. <laughs> Whoa. So, so it was like my way while you're trying to work. Oh, yeah, man. Out. Totally, dude. <laughs> it had to be Ken's way or it was no way. Okay. Um, but he was brutal in the fact that, um, that people were seriously getting injured. Okay. Um, my wrists were so hammered that that I was putting tons of tape on my wrist just so I could do a handstand. Yeah. Um, because I was just bashing, you yeah. know, my wrists. And um, he would always say this classic term that he had for anyone that injured himself. He'd be like this, put some ice on it. You know, and you're like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> put some ice on it. I mean, I've seen a guy do a backflip over the bar. And he smashed his ankles. They swelled up. He couldn't stand on him, and he told this guy to put some fucking ice on it. Jesus. And you're like, how do you get away with that? Nowadays, you'd go to jail for that. Yeah. Yeah, but he was cool. Isn't you know? America like uh, lawsuit happy? Yeah, exactly. Like, no one ever sued him. It was like, uh, I, I, 
he was an untouchable. Why? I don't know. It still buckles my mind. <laughs> you know, there are people that are running through parking lots, throwing themselves in front of cars so they could sue people. Yeah. In America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they Where? trip in Walmart and they'll sue Walmart. Yeah. This guy legitimately damaged people and never was sued. Because parents would be like, yeah, my son's a cunt. <laughs> like, no, but he, he had the, an accident, seriously. Was, was, he like, uh, was he like the coach that could get you to the Nationals? Was yeah, he like, yeah. He coached, he was he that could, guy? Yeah, he coached my, my, my coach from Parallel So people bars. don't want to fuck up that relationship in case in the future. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. I mean, he only, he only brought two people to serious, serious high lengths. And I mean, he always, he's the hometown boy. I mean, he, he, he always brought the team to win uh, state championships, mm. county championships. Uh, it just, it happened. Yeah. You know, we always won. State champion, which is a big thing. Yeah. So uh, when state we went to- New York State, right? New York State. How big is New York State? It's how, massive. Yeah, like how many, what's the population? Uh, I, dude, I don't know this. Like, okay, you have to talk to us. Uh, wait, wait, no, bone, bone. We, we, we can talk to Google, man. We don't All have right, to know shit. Great. That's uh, the amazing world of the internet. Yeah. Uh, but that's, uh, so population is 20 million. So that's 20. like uh, 40 times the size of our island, basically, population-wise. There you go. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's uh, for, you, for, for anyone to become the champion of that many people. Is and he ridiculous. just delivered, man. He just delivered. So any school that went against us, they would just uh, bow their head and be like, okay, we're going we're gonna to be beaten. It's okay. We're here. We showed up to lose. Against you guys. Oh, yeah. They knew that they were going to lose. Okay, and how, how did you eventually make it to the main to the, team? Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. I made varsity in my last year. Um, okay, and I again, did, what's varsity? Because that's varsity like level. I've heard man. that on we Beverly there. Hills 90210, like 20 years ago. But yeah. I'm not really sure what. Yeah, so, you know, we, we got the, the letter, you know, you got, you, you know, you're on the team and you're the real deal. Okay. But I was a specialist. I was an all-around guy. I didn't do all the, all the apparatus. So I did, uh, focused on uh, rings. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Parallel bars and okay. floor. Rings, parallel bar, and, and floor. floor. Yeah. And and how did you do? On um, parallel bars, man, just untouchable. Really good. Floor, mm, not the best, but uh, I hung in there. And, and rings, another good one. I I was second on the team. The first guy who was the best. Uh huh. He won the uh, in the the U.S. Cup. So another great, and that's the brother. Of the guy, Chris. And Chris Lamort was the guy who won the Goodwill Games, 1998. Okay. He just Serious beat, stuff. He just blew, you know, the walls off. You know, everybody was like, who is this guy? Uh, he's a boiler mechanic, you know. <laughs> and they're like, so he trains in the morning and does free kids classes, helps out the coach, and then he works night shifts. What time does he have to train for himself? And this dude was just determined. Yeah. And go figure, you know, this guy could have done way more. But uh, it was a, a little bit of a, you know, not, not a drunk, but he used to go to this place called uh, All Aboard Pub, uh-huh. and you could see him down there drinking beers. Uh-huh. And, you know, like, man, you could have done more. But the strongest guy that I've ever seen do one-arm pull-ups, I mean, this dude is just a, a house <laughs> of a man. And he was the one that really got me into parallel bars and, you know, forced me on the rings because I was good friends with his brother, which was Eric. And what was your, your best achievement uh, in yeah. gymnastics? What was that? Parallel bars. Yeah, winning first. Yeah, Winning first at what? Yeah. Parallel bars. Yeah, but in Doing what? The event. In what uh, yeah, we went states. So you won the states. Yeah. Okay. We but. did. As a whole team, we came together winning states. And then there are people that can win in certain events. And you wanted the parallel bars. Parallel bars. Wow. Okay. Cool, man. As I said, man, like the... the like what I thought of gymnastics probably before I met you uh, was like, I never really watched gymnastics. I thought uh, mm. it was like the, like the floor thing was like something my sister would like to watch or something like that. Mm. But then when I met you and then I started to understand like uh, the how tough you have to be. Man. And uh, like uh, the, then I was like looking into like the insane amount of hours of training. Hours, man. Like, we did four. Four hours a Jeez. day. And, and it's and intense. To go back to go back to Ken Freeheim and what he did and how brutal he was is that one guy was running full speed down the runway to do a vault, mm-hmm. which is something that I didn't progress in. So I didn't do it. And this guy, James, just hits the vault. Boom! Just hits it. 
And the coach was like, God damn it. Walk it off, James. Walk it off. And he looked at the coach and was like, Coach, I'm, I really got a, a pain right here. And he grabbed his side. And I'll never forget it. He told him, just do, do laps around the gym. Walk it off. And um, he did two laps around the gym. I mean, limping. And all of a sudden, he collapsed. And we ran over to him. And we realized that it was serious. Um, this guy went to the hospital. They did an emergency uh, operation. And he found out that this guy had uh, ruptured his spleen. Oh. So, I mean, he went from uh, being an athletic kid to being uh, a worthless stick. And these parents didn't sue him either. And it was like, that's incredible. I, 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 it, we didn't get it, and it, it never connected. We never, uh, like nowadays, you'd be like, oh, don't be associated with this person. And then you leave the team. We didn't leave the team. Yeah. Nobody left the team. It was like, just do your fucking work. Yeah. You know, and we feel bad for him, and we'll go see him in hospital. But at you know, the we same were time, there. you were ambitious, and you wanted to win. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, not only just win. I mean, it what was, was what was it, it was giving easy. you? What it was, was the, the experience giving you? Now that you look back, because it feels like uh, probably there's a sense of community as well, like a family. Yeah, you like you knew who you know the people that were going to give you some problems. You know, as in technique, technical wise, you'd be like, okay, this guy's going to be really good. We got to beat him. Got to stick our landings. You got to know that if you don't stick the landing, you're going to lose points. And you want to make sure that your points are counting enough to yeah, ultimately uh, win. No, but my question is, um, uh, what, what did what, I what, take what, home? What, 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 what makes you uh, kind of like stay the course, like endure? Because obviously this guy is like a, a military Ken, drill sergeant. Yeah, but Ken, Ken was, uh, you needed to impress this guy. Like you, you came wanted in, to, okay. you came in, he was like, he was like my fucking dad, man. That's what I thought. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. you like, you looked at him and he, if he looked away from you, it was like you, 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 I was ashamed of myself. You were forsaken by your father almost. I'm forsaken by my father. I didn't have a father. So exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, any man that was in my life, I tried to have the, I, I tried to foster that. Yeah. It's uh, weird. Yeah. That's uh And that's dangerous. Could be dangerous, Dad. Yeah. Could I mean, I think everybody did, you know, so everyone that had a dad, because I think I was the only one that didn't have a dad, because, mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about suburban life, you know, everybody had a dad. Um, I think everybody was in that same boat of, that's your second dad. Yeah. And it was like, what he says is, is, is almighty rule. Yeah. It's like Muhammad coming down from the, the hill with the, uh, the, from the mountain with the commandments. That's uh, Moses, bro. Oh, <laughs> this is the fucking whiskey, man. What the fuck? That don't, is don't, Moses. Don't blame your theological redaction, deficiencies redaction. on uh, Moses. Moses did come down with we'll the... We'll walk that one back. Yeah. Holy shit. Um, yeah, so he was Moses. All right, so after that um, theological backflip, uh, where was your mom in the meantime? Mom didn't come to too many meets, to be honest. She came to states, ones, county, county meets, you know, big ones, important ones, but grandma was always there. She was always the embarrassing, almost mom. You know, she'd always go like this, get him, Big John. She called me Big John. So uh, that's yeah, that's my, that was my nickname there. That's so nice, her. man. Big John. Yeah, Big John had to go out there and you show him. And I was like, oh my God, Jesus Christ. What, what was uh, grandma's name? Barbara. She was Barbara. Uh, well, and well, she was told by Ken, listen, when we come to meets, you can't be so loud because we could actually lose points for that. So you have to be quiet at them. It's like tennis, you know? You can't be loud and obnoxious. Did Ken and your grandma have a good relationship? No, they didn't. No, he didn't talk to any parents. No? No. He just wanted to deal with you. You know, yeah. if parents came to a training session, they'd, he would tell them to leave. There's no, there's no room for a parent in there. And, and uh, when you look back, what did gymnastics give you? Like, what do you still carry with you from that time? But, You're more in tune with your body. I, I tell people that, uh, you know, parents, even now, you know, I say, listen, it's not about, you know, I'm telling you that your kid should do gymnastics, but I think it's like a user's manual for understanding your body. Uh, you know, for me, I understand how to manipulate myself. Like if I need to climb a wall or if I need to invert myself, I can do that. 
because of gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So I tell parents, you know, it's it's. I think it's like, if if it was an instrument, it'd be like the piano. It's like the master of movements. You know, uh, if you do gymnastics, I think if you were to just go and just wrestle, I think you'd be better at wrestling, having been a gymnast. Uh -huh. I think for any sport, I think it's like the piano of sports. Yeah. Because yeah. you're you're okay. The negative to gymnastics is that gymnastics doesn't have high stamina. Okay. You're not going long distance. So in the long distance game, like running, I fucking hated running, man. I still hate running, but I respect it. But when you're running and you're a gymnast, we don't run very far, man. We just go from point A to point B. So when you're running on the floor, it's like, back, round up back handspring, double back tuck, boom, stick, land, done. Okay. So you go to your moves. There's not long distance running. So like, you know, Ken wouldn't say, hey, we're going to go run two miles. It's not functional for us. But shit, that was the one aspect that if I could say there's one negative to gymnastics is that you don't have stamina, high, high, sorry, cardiovascular respiratory system. It's never challenged high. Okay. But doing that explosive stuff like, uh, I don't know, like the rings seems like um, you need a lot of uh, bursts, explosive bursts of energy. Yeah, explosive strength. So you give me box jumps, I'm going to jump straight to the roof. You know, because I have it. Olympic weightlifting, uh, it comes easy to me because of gymnastics. You know, gymnastics is anything where I have to be super explosive, it comes real natural and easy for me. Awesome. If I need to go long distance and they say, oh, yeah, uh, body weight uh, on the barbell, squat for five minutes, do as many reps as you can, I'm going to die, man. My legs are going to burn out. They're going to get lactic acid, and I'm probably not going to win. Okay. Because that's, that's, that's endurance. So anything endurance, man. I've done classes where we run, and I'm not the first one that passes through. Some of my clients are run faster than me. Correction, not faster, longer. They go, they go harder, longer. I'll push, and I have mental grit, so I always keep up with them. But some people are just more but talented. But you do the long distance. Well, that's not, I guess. I guess the the suck that you do is not exactly. Uh, it's not. It's more about mental toughness. No, the that's suck that you do. Yeah, it's like man, that's, that's uh, it's torture. Yeah. That's that's carrying a, a heavy back. It's like voluntary torture, that well, like you've asked me on a couple of times. No man, they pay. People pay to be yes, yeah, so it's voluntary. Yeah. Well uh, voluntary is uh, okay, they volunteer, but they Yeah, no, they but volunteer they, they pay, man. To pay and get tortured oh, yeah. at the same time. There's man, a few they love um, masochists around. Well, dude, they get a t shirt. It's pretty cool. One day, man. One day. Cool I don't t shirt. Know. You get a cool t shirt that says embrace the suck. The next one's three, so the next one's three. How do you mean? Yeah, so zero zero one was our first embrace of suck. Now it's zero zero two. Can you just like explain what the suck is? So the people suck. Can the suck like is uh, so when we went through some training camps, mm. they used to put us through, you know, horrible, just all day. Is this is in, in the in the, in the navy? Military. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So they just give us like evolutions, and these evolutions would just. Some of them were short evolutions, they'd be beach evolutions. So one was a box drill where we'd have to bear crawl the beach, okay, jump into the sea okay. or the ocean, and then you'd have to swim out maybe 50 meters, and then you had to swim the length of the beach, come back to 50 meters, and then you're back on the beach again, and they'd make you do the drill again. So you'd bear crawl again, and the lactic acid, everything's just hurting. You get in the water. After a bear crawl, your whole body's broken. You don't want to go in the water. <laughs> and then you're cold because you're like, shit, I'm bear crawling. It's a windy day. They don't give a fuck. Get back in the water. And you're like, shit, I'm bear crawling. I'm hurting. Am I going to fucking drown? It's fucking cold. You don't want to do it, right? Do people drown? Well, no. They, they, they have guys with fins that are, that are watching you. Mm. Yeah, you're always protected to some degree. They're not going to just say, hey, go out but there and But how swim. close do you get to drowning before someone steps oh, in? Oh, they'll, they'll, yeah, they'll let you go down. Like, you have to be flaring your arms. And, and if you do that and you get rescued and, and you get to the point where you can't handle it, then see you later. You're not going to go into this program. Ah. You know, to be a rescue swimmer, you have to pass uh, evolutions. If you don't have the times, you don't make the times, then you don't become. And the suck is inspired by this uh, yeah, uh, you know, it, experience it, of yours? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that and, uh, I mean, Ken, Ken's training, you know, is more my innovative side to training because he had tons of different ways to work the body. 
Okay. You know, so that was an influence as well. Okay. But the military showed me that there's 20 million ways to skin a cat. And you can skin a cat by, you know, making them hold their breath while jumping rope. You know, that was one thing that we had to do. We had to hold our breath. And the only time that the instructor would count your reps is that when you are doing it, you know, with your breath held. Wow. And um, it's, it's, it's a lot harder than it sounds. Yeah. But when you're doing 300 reps with your breath held and then you have to get in the pool and swim, man, it sucks. I had a friend, uh, you know, Andrew Falzon? The, we call him the man who gave Parkinson's the finger. He, the yeah. Guy, yeah, he's he's a guy. Oh man, what a fucking fantastic guy! I, I, we should have him on like really soon. Uh, nice. So when Andrew basically uh, at age twenty two, he was already like a bouncer at Fuego or whatever, like right. thick neck like that. Wow. Was doing mixed martial arts when mixed martial arts wasn't even a thing here. The guy was just like cool. fucking hard. Right. Like when you see a picture of him, he looks like a at twenty two he looked like a tree trunk, uh, but at twenty four nice. he contracted Parkinson's. Man, this guy. Um, and now he's almost, he's, no, he's more than, he's always like 42. Um, and it's like the Dude, mental toughness, 40, the mental toughness that came with him doing all the mixed martial arts and all the physical stuff and, and the bouncing and all of that, he used in order to kind of negotiate Parkinson's. Right. And recently, we all kind of got into like figuring out who has the best deadlift. And Andrew would like do his workout, like his five by five, yeah. holding his breath. So he'd do like five reps, yeah, holding his breath, which was like fucking insane. All five reps? All five reps. Oh, wow. All five reps. And because he, I, I agree with the holding the breath. Because it holds your position. Yes, no, but no, not but five never. Reps. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Oh, wow. Never. No, like like he would get to the... When we fall over. To, like, every position, he's holding his breath. So he's standing up, breath holding, going down. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I got to do like it now. Mentally, uh, just an animal, man. Just an animal. Well, I'm going to do it now. Thank you for the inspiration. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have no idea. I, I really can't he understand how you guys five rep max. don't know each he other. He did it the five by five weight. Yes, yes, like yes, heavy, yes. There's heavy. videos of it somewhere around the Shit. internet. There's videos of it. Uh, Props, man. And I think I'm the guy holding the camera, like completely like fangirling the show. Oh, fuck. <laughs> nice. Like completely ruining the I experience for everyone else. I would have uh, fanboyed him. So... Um, yeah, this episode of uh, the Joe Money Podcast is brought to you guys by the Nissan Juke. Yeah, uh, Mr. Spartan. It's, it's a fantastic a, car. I, dude, if I had the money, I'd buy it. That, that would be all right. Dude, I, I like it, man. Yeah, Some yeah, people yeah. don't, but I do. No, no, I think it's the, the Jennifer Lopez of cars. It's got like a fucking <laughs> fat ass. Okay. <laughs> and I like Jennifer Lopez. Yes. Um, I mean, my partner doesn't? hears that, man. Uh, she's probably going to give you me liked, shit for that. You liked in the past. I liked, when you were... I liked her before I met Melanie. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, or, or the Beyonce. I don't know. Beyonce? Lo Jennifer no, Lopez? No, I wasn't a Beyonce no, person. No, I think, I think I was more of Beyonce. I think the allure for Beyonce. I, I like that Latina thing. So I liked uh, Penelope Cruz mm -hmm. and Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this car is the... Uh, yeah, well, it's got a nice uh, back end, and it's nineteen thousand two hundred and fifty. So I think the new, new, I think the new, the new word for this car is going to be the Nissan J Lo. The Nissan J Lo, yeah. I think Maybe. that. I think we should talk to them about or, it. Or let's talk to Nissan. Or the Nissan Beyonce. I don't know what the fuck you guys think. Let's have a poll. Uh, oh, J Lo for sure, man. Dude. Yeah, J Lo. Oh, okay, 100%. show of hands, J Lo. J Lo show of oh shit I'm outnumbered Nissan, outgunned Beyonce, completely Mark man, doesn't even make sense man J Lo Jesus <laughs> Christ the J Lo bunch of, bunch of racists yeah but no you got to think about it this way which would you rather get in you'd say oh I'm getting in my Beyonce it doesn't sound right but you'd be like I'm getting in my J Lo yeah uh, it just sounds like something that you'd want to get in yeah oh, partner, no, no, here's no, this. That, that. get yeah, in no, as no, in, no, no, no man it, get in the, behind the wheel I suggest you quit while you're not ahead yeah man. true. Well, um, I'll take another sip of whiskey. So I'll blame it on the whiskey. <laughs> so basically, uh, w at which point did you abandon like uh, gymnastics? Because at the point you went to the military as well, right? Yeah. And I'm assuming you didn't. Did you have time to do gymnastics in the military or? Uh, I used. To, funny enough, I did. I, I I didn't do gymnastics myself. I used to teach some of the guys. Okay. Yeah. Was that? Uh, like was that part of the routine? 
Or did you just like teach some of the guys in the no, dorms? Man, I just, I, one thing? day, I think I did one on the beach. You know, we were getting hammered. And then I used to do top Hammered jet. like drinking? Yeah, drinking. Yeah, I was a little bit of like, uh, when they say that uh, Navy guys drink, I made sure that that stuck. Yeah. yeah. Live up to expectations. Oh, I lived up to it. Fully. Yeah. Even when I came out, I think I, I, I don't think, I, I know I had a drinking problem. Definitely. 100%. Still? No. No, good. Like I don't me. remember the last time I had a drink. In fact, dude, I'm already feeling this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll we, we slow down on the No, 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 in a good way. In a good I'm, way. I'm always feeling like it's, floaty. It's, it's, it's nice. It's, dude, it's, it's very serious. nice whiskey. It's dangerously Bro, yeah. nice whiskey. Super. Yeah. How did you wind up in the in the military? Okay, that's, that's actually a tough story, you know? Um, that one... Uh, was due to, you know, my grandmother, she, uh, she had cancer and, and nobody knew about it. Cause she was, she was that strong, like, like an Oak, you know, um, nobody could shake her. So she held the fact that she had cancer. I don't even think she knew cause she didn't go to doctors or anything, but she was severely probably going through some serious pains and she was always a heavy set woman, you know? And all of a sudden, you know, like, um, my first personal training job was that um, when I would come back home from all this gymnastic stuff, um, you know, I trained my grandma, you know, I'd just give her some like you know, easy stuff, you know, we'd do some planks and you know, just mess around at the house. And I found out that she was losing a lot of weight and uh, w everybody thought that it was because I was working her out. Yeah. And I was like, ah, I'm just messing with grandma, you know? She's not really doing workouts, hardcore workouts. Turned out that she had cancer. And um, by the time that she got, um, um, the doctors, you know, said you have cancer. Uh, it was like at the point where she had cancer everywhere. She wow. had blood cancer, bone cancer. She had cancer in her brain. Wow. So this woman was probably why, why did it take walking so long, through. Though, for people to really you know, I, I, dude, I don't know, man. I, you know, my grandmother was the type of person that would just read at night. Want me to, um, you know, when I lived with her, she wanted me to, you know, just. Think before I talk, study, do good in school, and do something with myself. And she knew that I didn't have the opportunities that my cousins had. You know, like my cousins, um, they had stable ho households. And they knew, she knew that my brother had a father that was in his life. And when she saw me not having a dad and no one to really take me, and foster me, she kind of became my second mom, you know, and said, I'm going to do my best, you know, and she didn't have it easy because my mom didn't make it easy for her. She'd be like, give me my fucking son back, you know, there were fights, man. There were this fights. is your mom's mom, right? Yeah, she fought to try to have me as much as she could. And she tried to say, you know, Rita, we have to put this kid in a good school. Huh. Uh, I think once I went to a Catholic school. That didn't work out too well. Why? Why was uh, the grandma like not forthcoming with returning you to your mother? Because she knew that she was lost, man. I mean, she was bouncing around. She didn't. We weren't stable. We weren't stable. I mean, uh, we got we got to the point where uh, we were homeless. Oh. Okay. And then, and the pride that she had, you know, not to go to her, her you know, to her mom was uh, so big that we were living in the back of the car. Okay. Yeah. And who was we? You and your mom? Me and my brother. And my sister wasn't born yet. It was actually after a fight that um, my brother, my brother's father was a, uh, you know, hunter type guy, you know, and he, he, he'd be macho, but he'd be a little bit, you know, not feminine, but he cared about his looks and stuff. Okay. And this guy, Jim, um, which is my sister's father. He's just such a... Man, if you can honestly say that there's a piece of shit on this planet, like, you'd look at him and just say, man, you're a fucking piece of shit. This guy what used made to him say... What a piece of shit? Like, he was uh, the type of guy that came up to my brother and he would go, your daddy's a fairy and he's a pixie stick. Faggot. And we're like, dude, why are you talking about his dad like that? You know? And he'd be like, we all know that he's a faggot. And, you know, it, it got to the point where my brother stepped up and he hit him with a, with a brush. Well, 
You're talking about a kid. A kid can't hurt an adult. This adult took the fucking hairbrush and he started beating the shit out of my brother. So he jumped on his back and I was trying to say, don't fuck with my brother, don't, don't fucking hurt him. And my mom walked in and she saw the fucking commotion and he's like, you're fucking kids. And my mom fucking blew up, what the fuck? You know, the, the kitchen was leveled, uh, it was serious. That was a fucking horrendous fucking fight, man. And Whose side did your mother take? Ours, ours, totally. No, she knew it was fucked up. I mean, she saw me, you know, bear hugging this guy, trying to stop him from beating the shit out of my brother. Um, she was, she was fucking pregnant with his kid, and she said, "Jim, we're getting the fuck out of here." And that's it, not something that you actually say to somebody that's not fucking stable. So he started leveling the the the, the kitchen. And at that point, my mom What's was that scared. Mean, leveling the kitchen, like oh, you flipped the table, table oh, yeah, threw yeah. all the plates, man. Everything's just breaking, just shit, just going, shh, shh. just and terrorizing, terrorizing oh, oh. this 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 family. piece of shit house. Yeah. Uh, we were renting a shithole house in probably one of the most scum places we've ever lived. And I'll never forget it, Selden on Mooney Pond Road, the shittiest area in Long Island. Um, which was, you know, one mile away from where my mom met him, which is at a biker bar. So he's a biker bar type piece of shit guy. And you're how old at this time? Uh, at this time, dude, I don't know. I don't know completely. I was a teenager uh -huh. and my, my, my brother was probably like five. So I was, oh well, yeah, we're 10 years apart. So he, I was 15 and I'll never forget that this was the time when, um, I was like, holy shit, shit's real, you know? I had uh, my uncle at the time. Um, he gave me these samurai swords. And my mom, wore, all the shit was going down. Like actual samurai swords that could... Yeah, like you can kill somebody be, with them. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Lethal I, weapons. So my uncle now, who's not really my uncle anymore, because he's not married to my aunt anymore. Okay. So I don't know what you would consider him. Yeah. Uh. I don't know. Uh, maybe an uncle. I'm going to call him Uncle Bernie. I have so many brothers and sisters that are, oh, it's so uh, well, complicated with me. You know so what? He's still Uncle Bernie. I Uncle would Bernie. that entirely. Uncle Bernie was the type of guy that was like, okay, well, you know, he was a mechanic by trade. Okay. And after, he would go to the flea market and sell blades. Okay. So he used to sell fucking knives, switch blades, whatever. Yeah. So the flea markets were full of like shady people that would just buy his shit. Okay. And he made a whole business out of it. So for my birthday... He got me swords. And we go there, ding, ding, my friends, playing with these fucking swords, man, like assholes. <laughs> and my mom, you know, when the, the, the kitchen was getting leveled, um, she tried to make a phone call to the police. And I've never witnessed this in my life, except for this man. In his rage, with his bare hands, he took the telephone cord and he fucking snapped it. And I just thought to myself, holy shit. Like, I don't know too many people that can do that. And I don't think he was super strong. I think it was just, you know that rage strength that you get yeah, when yeah, you're yeah. just fully raged out? Yeah. And I said, all right, this is, this is fucking horrendous. We're in fucking DEF CON. Fucking, we're going to go into DEF CON 3. This is it. We have to fucking go there. Um. My mom made a beeline. She packed up a bag, and she had just thrown some clothes in. She threw in some clothes for my brother, and she threw in some clothes for herself. She forgot to throw in clothes for me, so I went in my pajamas, and I didn't have any fucking clothes. But it's not that she didn't care for me. I think she just had in the clothes rush. there. Yeah, yeah, it's an emergency. She yeah. just threw clothes in a bag, and she said, we're getting the fuck out of here. And Jim went from... I'm going to fucking annihilate this whole house and kill everybody to don't leave, don't leave. And it flipped the script to don't leave, don't leave. And my mom's trying to find her way out the door. She's doing this, you know. And when she went to go out the door, he, boom, gave her one in the stomach. Oh, wow. And with your preg she was pregnant with your sister. With his own kid. With his own fucking kid. That's yeah, so his kid. Damn. Now, I told this story to my sister, and we had a heart-to-heart. -heart. She took me off Facebook 
and said, I don't believe this story. And I said, well, I mean, I can't make this up. How do you make this up? Well, I ran into my room. Everybody thought that I was afraid. I ran into my room, and I got that samurai sword. I came up to Jim, and uh, I put that blade right to his neck. And I said, if you fucking move, I'm going to put this blade right through your neck. I'm going to fucking kill you. Did you mean it? Oh, absolutely, 100%. He stood at the wall, and he said, dude, don't do anything. I said, don't breathe, don't move. I will fucking kill you. And I told my mom, go get the shit. Get the keys to the car. Let's get the fuck out of here. So she got in the car, and we got in the car. Uh, once I took the blade off of his neck, and we got in the car. So basically, I have pajamas and a samurai sword. <laughs> I mean, you can laugh at it now. I mean, this is a fucked up story. It's just a fucked up mix. I mean, uh, dude, I, I <laughs> maybe it's alcohol. I don't know, dude, but... As I'm telling it, I'm like, okay, that's funny. And that's probably really good shit for a movie. But, like, that shit's real. Yeah. Like, I had a samurai sword and I had PJs. We got in the car. No shoes, yeah? Fucking barefoot. Go in the car and my mom put the car on. And all of a sudden, a fucking hand comes in to try to grab the keys. And the only thing I could think of is, I'm going to bite this motherfucker's hand. And I bit his hands. Ah, he pulled his hand in, and my mom just slapped it into reverse. Now, when I say that we lived on a shitty road, we lived on a high-traffic fucking road, man. She slapped that bitch into fucking reverse and just fucking gunned it with life. Yeah. And I don't know how we didn't get fucking into, a, like, a four-car pileup, man. <laughs> we made it. We got on the road, and we started driving. My next question as a kid, where are we going? Where are we going, yeah. She said, I don't know. Well, I said, well, all right, I'm in. What are we going to do? And we went to a motel for one day. Then when we didn't have the money for that, you know, we stayed in the car. Was your mother working at the time, though? Well, at this time, I mean, I, I don't know how you really work. No, she was, she was bartending. I, she did a whole bunch of shit. I don't know what she was doing at this time. I think just crushed, so probably not. Well. With a baby on the way, how, how far along in her pregnancy? Uh, second trimester. Yeah, no. Which it was is like six months, five months, six months. Yeah, no, it was, it was, yeah, it's showing the whole nine. Mm. And she was working at a bar. It's crazy. Wow. I don't get it. I mean, listen, some people's lives are different. You know, she had to take a lot of steps that, honestly, when I look back at them, and now I'm recounting, like, almost everything, you have to say, man... She's gone through some shit. I mean, I did too. Um, I think one of the biggest negatives that she's done is that she did a lot of negative reinforcing. She said things like, Tommy, you're a fucking idiot. Um, I'm a fucking idiot. John, you're a fucking idiot. You're, you're no good. You know, we always raised that way. Where you're a fucking moron, John. And I <laughs> laugh, smile, go around with it. So Would I was always that it? joker. I think to the point where... You, At the time, no. I thought it was normal. You know, I thought that this, this is how parents talk to their kids. And it clicked that it wasn't normal actually when, um, when I came here in Malta. So I lived my whole life thinking that that's normal shit. And then I saw how Maltese kids are raised and I'm like, these kids are fostered, man. They're, 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 watched you know they, 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 they do their homework and the parent watches them and they, they, they answer questions when they need the questions done like yeah. oh this is this is this is how it is yeah I didn't have that yeah uh, sometimes it can be uh, I, I think there's a lot of positive in that kind of child rearing where you're yeah. kind of like uh, a bit vigilant in the way that your kids are behaving and what yeah. they're getting into. But sometimes it can turn a bit edible, a bit oppressive, mm. where you kind of, uh, well, where, you, where yeah, you cause the kid to either rebel or like atrophize because everything is being done for them and then they have, zero toughness so then they go out right. into the workforce yeah and they're just like at the first sign of pressure they just like fold like a deck chair you know i see that here i see that here 
Okay. But so you have least, to find like I think a happy middle ground. But mentoring, like I thought that if I came home from school and I didn't piss off my mom, she'd let me fuck off and go right. outside. Yeah. You know? Uh, but if I pissed her off, she'd tell me, go to your fucking room and do your homework. So homework was like associated with negative behaviors. That like was my punishment. Homework. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, you can do whatever the... Yeah. Like she'd ask me sometimes if she picked me up from school, which was like rare. But if she did, she'd be like, you have any homework? And I'd say, no. And she'd be like, oh, cool. Like, who the fuck does that? Like, I, now I'm seeing parents. Now you're a parent. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I have a two, two, I have a two, two and a half, half, you know. Yeah, He's not yeah. coming home saying, you know, hey, Dad, I got homework. He's not hustling not. just yet. And I say, hey, man, do you have homework? <laughs> you know, but I, I know that I, w- I will go through his bag. And what what kind of parent do you think you're going to be? Or, I mean, what kind of parent are you? But, you know, the more... He grows and develops, and the more he's gonna need. Dude, I think guidance. I'm. I think I'm evolving. You know, like when I first had my, you know, my my child, I was like ultra protective. Like where I was like, I will annihilate anyone that comes near my child. Yeah. And you get that way where you're like, oh man, I'm gonna protect him from everything. Yeah. Now that he's getting older and he's getting his own like personality, he's almost like hardened like me. I'm like, shit, he's gonna protect himself. Yeah. And that's I'm just gonna give him. Really. I'm gonna give him just some skills and lessons, yeah. and I'm gonna open him to different doors. Like Thomas is gonna meet him. You know, he's already gone to Arate for some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He didn't do Jiu Jitsu. He just came to the gym. And he watched it. I got him a gi, so he was in there, and he felt like he was a part of it. So that's cool. Yeah. If he wants to do it, I'll give him access to it. Yeah. If he doesn't, and he says, "Oh, I want to do art like his mom," his mom's an artist. She likes that stuff. Yeah. If my kid says, "Dad, I want to paint." Great. Let's paint. Whatever he does, I want to make sure that he does it to the best of his ability. Correct. That's that's yeah. my my job is to foster whatever he wants to do and yeah. to be uh, a positive, you know, uh, thing in his life. So I I think to myself, if my kid needs help in any aspect, I'm going to be there to try to support him through whatever he needs to do. Yeah, I agree. So, but and I would also add to that. So I grew. I grew from being this. No one's gonna touch my kid. To to knowing that they have to. They're gonna have to find their own way. They're gonna. Yeah. 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 So when people see that I say, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna take my kids to the gun range," they're like, "Oh well, you know, your your kid's not gonna be you." And I say, "Okay, what I didn't say is gonna be me." They're like, "Oh, you know, you have so many expectations." I'm like, "No, I have none. I have only. uh, I want to expose him." To as many to things as possible. As many things as possible uh, that I know. And I know <laughs> shooting. I know Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I know what lifting weights. Yeah. That's my professions. You know, that's what I'm good at. You know, I'm good at, you know, okay, let's do combative sports. All right, let's do, you know, lifting weights. Or, okay, let's go shoot guns. Okay, it's what I'm good at. doesn't yeah. mean I want my kid to be good at. It's something that I can easily get him involved in. But if he comes to me and says, oh, at school, I really like painting. Yeah. His mom can do that. If he wants to do something totally different that we have no clue, I say, okay, time to find a coach. Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah, I, th- I think what you need to foster in your kids in this in this aspect is like a reverence for discipline and excellence. Mm. And then you can apply that to virtually, you can apply that to this conversation, you can yeah. apply that to making that vase or that whiskey. Yeah. As long as what you're doing, um, you're applying yourself in a way that you're really seeking to kind of improve yourself through the craft yeah. and, and you kind of like True. becoming an expert. You know, that's one thing, like one thing I always used to, because I used to have like a bit of a mentorship role when I was at Love and Malta. Yeah. I used to help cool. the, the, the videographers kind of find their footing and, and, and right, kind right. of like get their character. And the thing I used to always ask them was, and it sometimes used to take them like weeks to answer me. And, and Sean, if you're watching me, you still haven't fucking answered the question. <laughs> and it's been like a year on. And the question was like, who the hell are you, Sean? Uh, long boy, Sean, I used to call it like the giant. Like he, he's, he's like six. Six, I think. Like Fuck. I and I used to piss him off every morning. I used to walk in and go. He played like, basketball for Malta for sure. He played basketball not for Malta and in a one on one I would destroy you if you're watching. Nice. Um, no man, maybe fifteen years ago. But uh yeah, and I also used to ask, like, why the fuck are you in the room? 
All right, because they used to tell me like, how can I right. improve my skills? Like because the, the way you have to improve your skills is to understand why the fuck are you in the room? 100%. Why are you in the room and is ways are not in the room? Why did we have you here? What is your skill set that's making you stand out in a way right. that your contribution to the project, whatever the fuck, whatever the project is, could be redoing a flat or it could be shooting this music video. Exactly. Why did I get you and not anyone else? And once you can tell yourself that, yeah. then you've understood your identity and you understood where you're going. And then you get a, a, this reverence that I, I call a reverence for the discipline. Yeah. And you can pursue anything insofar that you understand, you know, like where you want to aim. And then once yeah. you know where you want to aim, you just go with it all, you know, all heart and soul and right. blood and sweat, right. you know. Um, so I think that's the, the number one thing I want to foster in my ki in my kids right. is, um, bro, I don't give a, I don't give, I don't care what it is that you do. Very much like you, in so far that you're actually trying to do it and you're right. trying to do it to a level that's respectable. Um, and uh, some people say, live your life like you're on a job interview every single day, you know? Because they say, oh, best foot forward. I'm like. Fuck, well, why do I have to do it on the first day? Yeah. You should do it every day. Yeah, because it's tiring. And some people say, hey, John, uh, we really like your class. I'm like, well, I mean, that's because I give it my all. And I'm like, I, I truly want that person to be the best version of themselves every single day, not just Saturday. Yeah. You know, some people are like, oh, they have their off moments. I'm like, okay, I have my off moments too. Sure. But I don't take my baggage in on work. Yeah. You know, sometimes we need to talk. I always like to say that the people that I train are not my clients, all right? They're also friends. If they have a problem, I could see it in them and I can feel it. So it's not, I'm a mentor mm, yeah. of, of, of strength, fitness, and even mental. So when I see them off, you know, I just say, okay, what's going on? You know, you reach out and you're, you're like a, a friend. You know, I hold them accountable for getting better at, you know, doing physical activity, building their minds. And I'm also making sure that they're okay. You know, I'm like, when you see somebody that's not okay, you know they're not okay. You say, hey, are you good? And they say, yeah. And then, you know, you say it again. You sure? And it's at that, at that point, and you tap in, and they, uh, they always break. Yeah. Wow, uh, you know. <laughs> and then the story comes. You know, yeah. and you're like, okay. You can either A... Just say, oh, well, that sucks, bro. But I don't do that, you know? I always try to assimilate it into what I've gone through. So I say, oh, shit, I've been there, bro. And then I'll, I'll give a little piece of me. Because I think that when someone shares them, that they're exposed. And that they feel like they're like, oh, well, you know, I've taken my clothes off. So yeah. I take my clothes off. Yeah. Not literally. Yes, I get that. Vic figured yeah. of course. So yeah. verbally, I'm taking off my clothes by saying, oh, shit, I've been there. Yeah. And uh, we're sharing, you know, a thing. And, it, it, you know, it'll vary. I had uh, one girl, and she, you know, broke up with the boyfriend because the boyfriend was, uh, you know, not seeing her. And it was an odd thing. And I saw how heartbroken she was. I was like, listen, <laughs> we're not going to train today. You're in a bad shape. And she's like, yeah, I, mean, I, don't know. I don't know what to do. I said, listen, we'll talk. We'll figure it out. You know, I can give you some suggestions and you're going to have to work on yourself. You know, I didn't give her a training session. I couldn't, you know, she wasn't in the right state of mind. You have to know when you can and when so, you can So you see yourself um, as not just a physical trainer, but per, like this mentorship role is like, uh, it's quite a, is it a broad? Okay. Well, that, what, that, I, what I can say about yeah. you from like a... A client perspective, I, yeah. I, I feel like client is such a crude, raw word. It, it is, dude. And it doesn't oh, feel like man. that. I almost feel like it's like, yeah. Like a your, prostitute. Your next all client all coming in. Yeah. Like, oh, uh, but what I can say is that you have, in your own strange way, uh, and uh, absolutely a strange way, it's a... Uh, what is, what is it, it? Like you're a, you, have, Love you, have, you have an empathy. No, you have an empathy. I do. That gets you to tune in to what that person wants to hear yeah. at the right moment. So I was telling you earlier when we were chilling out back there, you, yeah. I was telling you this story 
when I was, I'm not going to recount the whole story, but I was half dead looking at, I don't know, a flight of steps that was maybe a hundred steps. I was about to pass out. Yeah. You realized I was about to pass out. You walked up to me and like whispered in my ear, like Anthony Hopkins in the silence of the lambs or it, it, is that silence of the lambs it's, where he's a fucking yeah. murderer? That's yeah, he goes, the lambs. he goes, why are you being a pussy? And I'm like, son of a fucking bitch Man. and i just fucking sprinted past the whole class ran back down and i just yeah. did the fucking drill like yeah. like i was insane and i think i was for a moment insane because my yeah. whole body was like stop it shut up yeah and then later in the workout there was some some other dude and you're like and you you went to him with a, a far more kindness and you're like come on bro you can do it and i'm like why the fuck did he call me a pussy and that guy, he was like, come on, bro, okay. you can do it. So you got to think about it this way. So this is this is what sets me apart from other trainers. Uh, like, I don't dog any other trainers, and, and nor do I claim to say I'm the strongest, the fittest, the fastest. I'm definitely not any of those things. I'm not any of those things. I think my God-given talent is that I can make people do the things that they don't want to do. I have that ability. I have the ability uh, because I know how to tap into each person. Mm. If I called that person who I said, hey, bro, you can do it. That person needed that because that's all that they can take. You get what I'm saying? So mm. there are people that like to be motivated by you can do it. And they say, yeah, I can. If I told you, John, you can do it, bro. You'd be like this. No, I'm fucking out of breath. And I would say, Okay, I found out who you are right away. I said, okay, I'm going to walk up to this guy and I'm going to say, wow, you're being a big pussy. <laughs> and you were like, this motherfucker called me a pussy. I'm going to show him. <laughs> Some people can't take it, John. Some people can't take it, John. So you, you, you read those people and you see people, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to say that some people are pussies or not. Some people don't want to hear that. Some people will say, if I, if I said it to everybody, oh, dude, you're a pussy, they might turn around and go, yeah, I am a fucking pussy, thank you. And they'd feel bad about themselves and they'd just go, cry. I knew that you weren't that guy. So I'd say, okay, that, that fueled you. And that got you up the stairs. Yeah. That other guy just needed to be pushed. Hey man, get up those stairs, you can do it. You read it, I read it. Yeah. I read people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know what you can say, what you can't say. Uh, have I made mistakes? I have, we've all made mistakes. <laughs> I've made, I've made terrible mistakes. But uh, to just kind of underscore yeah. that uh, that ability of yours, uh, the, the the most recent time yeah. I've watched you work was at the Man Up camp when you yeah. had these 10 guys. Most of them hadn't even gone for a brisk walk, you know, for the yeah. past decade. They were, they were destroyed. They, and, but they finished. Oh, they, the they finished the thing that when you watch them finish it, I was getting exhausted. I was you, getting exhausted watching. Do you remember the guy that was actually good? The one that was cooking all the time. What the hell was his name? Yeah, uh, Rudwan. Rudwan. What a yeah, pain yeah. in the ass, but in a good way. Yes, exactly. I love yeah, him. Yeah, You know <laughs> how perfect. What Rud a pain, Rudwan. Rudwan if you're if listening, you're watching, you are a pain in the fucking ass, but in a good way. In a good way, exactly. Yeah, like I clashed with him right away. Yeah. But I found out that this guy was a decent dude. Yeah. And I had a special treat for Rudwan. Because I know that Rudwan is the guy that's going to show me that he can give me it all. Yeah. And I said, I said, I said, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to make everyone else suffer for Rudwan. And when Rudwan broke, and I knew that everyone else was broken, I knew that my job was complete until Rudwan was completely broken. Because I knew that that was the strength. You know, he would be like, Oh, if somebody, you know, needed rescuing, Rudwan was there. Or if somebody needed to be broken, Rudwan was there. But yeah. Rudwan needed to be broken. And I broke him. Yeah, I got him to the point where he was like, oh, shit, you know, I'm dying. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I said, yeah. and I was more like, so you, you can't do any more, pussy? <laughs> and he was like you, you know, like, oh, fuck, you know, I'm going to keep on going. But I, I killed them all. And I yeah. did it all in the way that they could. So there was another guy that needed to be lifted in the way of, hey man, you can do this. And he was like, oh, I, I, I really have to throw up. And I was like, "Yeah, you go and do that. Yeah, I didn't yell at him, I said, go, go and throw up. And when you come back, and you will, 
you will fucking come back. And when you're done throwing up and feeling fucking sorry for yourself, you're going to come back to this fucking group and you're going to man the fuck up. What did he do? Uh, he puked for a little while. He came back and he was like, all right, I'm back in. Let's go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, cool. And I, then I knew at that moment. I just love those Okay, tapes, everybody, man. everybody went to the max. Yeah. Everybody dropped the rock. Uh, everybody broke. And it's not that, you know, some people say I'm a sadist. Maybe I am. But I like the fact that when I see people hurting, I know. It's not the fact that I, I don't, I don't get an no, enjoyment. No, I don't think you're a sadist at all. Yeah, but I, I don't, don't get an enjoyment. Some people say, oh, John, you like seeing people hurt. Yes and no. In a sense, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I like seeing people hurt because when I know that you're hurting, that you're battling, you're coming to battle with your mind and your body. Yeah. Your mind and your body, when they come together, Man. And you push them to the maximum. You know that you are now coming over what we call the edge. They say, walk around the edge, but don't go over the edge. Yeah. I want to see how far someone's willing to go. Because I know that if you go all the way, that you're going to build yourself mentally and you're going to build yourself physically. Yeah. The shit that tells you when you... Like I watched this guy, I remember this guy, a very good friend of mine, uh, that puked. And I know he's not a physical guy at all. Yeah. Um, there were two people that puked. There so were two one? people that puked. Right. Um, but but the, so one was it guy. Was two or three? No, there was two guys that two, puked. Two, two. So two. one guy was was Damien, who's my best friend, who's just like a naturally strong guy. Like Damien used to be the guy where. The guy who owns houses. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Damien was the guy that even growing up, for example, cool. we'd all be going to the gym all summer and then he'd just turn up one day with a beer and a cigarette. So not to stop you, but he's the guy that you say you can do it. You don't call that guy a pussy. Yeah, I've seen that guy getting called a pussy and it didn't end well but, at all. Yeah. But that, yeah, exactly. That's why I'm saying I'm good at reading it. So now that you told me who it is, rude one, you can call him a pussy. He'll get pissed and he'll want to fight you, but you know what? He's going to go. He's yeah, yeah. he wants to, he has, he wants to prove I to called, you that he's... What's, what's his name? Damien. Damien. If I called Damien a pussy, he would have not liked me, been yeah. pissed at me, yeah. but he would have been like, fuck you, bro. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm going to leave now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've now motivated you. I didn't motivate nothing. Yeah, I just, now, I, now, I, now I stopped you yeah, yeah, yeah. from working out. And, I, and I'll tell but you, Damien's John. very naturally strong. Uh, I mean, I've seen him hit guys and dude, it was like, I, devastating. And, I, and dude, he might have hit me. That would have been terrible. Yeah, uh, no. Thing for, the, no. for the whole thing. But, uh, but actually, it, I think after, after the, the workout was done, I think he actually said he was like two steps away from wanting to fucking crack me in the face. <laughs> I think, I think that was honest. That it's was an likely, honest conversation. It's likely. It's like because dude, he uh, said honestly, you, you get dude, to the edge. You get I, to the I, edge. It's I, nice. He shook my hand. He said, "Dude, that was the fucking worst I've ever done. It like that's the worst For I've sure. ever felt in my life." And I was like, "Dude, you did a great job." He's like, "Dude, I came two fucking steps from like wanting to level your face in." I was yeah, like, yeah. "Great, good job, bro." Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact yeah. that you didn't level my face. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that you completed it. That you completed it. No, yeah. it was it was a well, fantastic I mean, thing to watch because I know how hard those workouts are and to see people yeah. that I know are not physically active. Like Damien hasn't been physically active for a very long time. Yeah. And to see him complete that and there was, uh, well, there was a few people there that, uh, that I know, like, uh, you know, like the, they, they don't even consider exercise, but they just yeah. did the exercise because they knew it was part of, of the whole man up program. So and I went through the man I went through the man up program. So as a mentor, I told you straight up, I need the fucking man up too. So I was the only mentor or the only person that was, you know, chosen by you to be there. I said I'm gonna do it. So I did the I did the whole man up camp. I did it with them. Yeah. You know? So learning who they were, that was cool. That's why uh, I remember we had the conversation before. Like we all prepped for this whole thing. Yeah. And I remember you telling me vividly, John, do a workout that's going to get them, you know, to the edge, but don't fucking kill them. Yeah. You know, you weren't telling yeah, me to be listened. nice, but you, you said, listened really well. you said, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, but this is the point I'm trying to make is that you said, listen, these guys are, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you, you're dealing with people that probably haven't worked out in a while. So, you know, take it easy on them. Having been there, and sharing the experience made me say, you know, fucking, I'm flipping the script here. You know, yeah, we yeah. all need to man up. Today, we're going to man up yeah. in a different way. 
We did team building events. We did uh, learning, uh, you know, about Dr. Juice, man. We did a whole bunch of shit. And it was all awesome shit. But when I got to know these guys on the different levels, I said, nah, man, I'm going to throw it at them. And yeah. I'm going to throw it at them because I know that the workout that I gave them, I could scale it. I could say, okay, this guy's going to get this. This guy's going to get that. And that one, that. And then that's why I gave Rude one. He automatically chose the heaviest rock. Yes, yes, he did. He did. Yeah, he said, I said to him, and you know how I got him to pick that heavy rock? It was simple. Do you know that there's a method to my madness? I looked at Rudwan's rock and I, I and I lifted it up and I said this. I went, bro, that that's a little too heavy for you. <laughs> he said, fuck you, bro. I can handle it. And I went, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, and he, he fucking, he chose it. You know, and I knew that that was going to set him in stone. To say, oh no, dude, uh, this is a hard workout. I don't think you can handle that. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, fuck you, bro. I'm gonna do it. Now, if I did that to any other person in that man up camp, maybe some, yeah. But like, the guy that I sent to you, if I said, dude, you can't lift that fucking rock, he'd be like, thanks for fucking motivating me like that, bro. Thanks for bringing me down. See, everybody's different. Yeah, 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 sure. You know, sure, we sure. we need to... What was great about the, the camp was that the first day was pretty relaxed. We did the fire. We got right. to know each other. We had the whiskey. And I and fucked we, up my camp. You fucked up your camp. Oh my God, man. I couldn't fucking do the shelter. And we sent everyone to sleep like, like, hey, guys, like this is a really nice uh, experience for you to chill out and unwind. Like literally four hours later, man. Like they slept four hours later. Me and this guy, like, get the fuck out the fucking camp. Yeah, and like with plans and flashlights and shit. And I was like, what the fuck? Get the fuck. And then we, then we, then we started uh, doing yeah. countdowns. Like thirty yeah. seconds to get water, or else no fucking water the whole workout. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and then, and then one person said this, and it was it was perfect. It was exactly what we were looking for. Was, you know, oh. Well, it's hard for me to wake up. And I said, that's your fucking problem. I said, I'm telling you to get the fuck up. So you're going to have to get the fuck up. Well, it's hard for me. I said, life's hard. <laughs> Simple. I remember this conversation. Life's I, hard. I remember life's hard. Get the fuck up now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes maybe your alarm clock doesn't sound like me, where I say, get the fuck up now. But that's what it means. But if I say get the fuck up now, and yeah. you you've you've chosen to take part in a fucking camp that says man the fuck up, well get the fuck up. Simple. Yeah. So, bro, um, we've digressed a bit because the original question was how did you get into the military? Oh man, uh, yeah. Well, uh, that's yeah, that's uh, that's a sad one. That well, when I told you that my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. Um. The doctors told me uh, I was a I was a lifeguard at the time. Um, that was my first on the books job. My first off the books job. I was a beer distributor. I used to work at the uh, the local shithole beer distributor, and I used to deal with all the scum that used to bring their empty cans, and I used to count all the cans and give them their chit, you know, like a little uh, a little paper that would say. Okay, he gets three three dollars and fifty cents for all the cans that they redeemed. But my original first real job was being a lifeguard, and my grandmother was so proud, you know, like oh, he's a lifeguard, you know, he's protecting kids at a pool. <laughs> okay, and finding out that she went to the hospital, it was like oh man, crushing. Um, went to the hospital, and I'll never forget the doctor saying, "There's nothing that we can do." And I said, you fucking fix her. Because I didn't understand. I, I thought, you're a doctor. Fix her. It's simple. You know, she's only 68 years old. It's like, she's got tons of life to live. And you don't understand the gravity because when you're young, you still know shit. You know, I see so many young people and I'm just like, man, you don't know shit. You know, and they're like, oh, what do you know? Yeah. I said, I don't know at all, but I know more than you do. And... I got into the military because my grandmother's last dying words were, your mom will not do what's right by you. You need to go into the military. And it was literally her last dying words because it was like, we were all in the room and she said, can you give us space? 
you know, to the whole family, you know, because we were going there in different turns, you know, and yeah. sometimes it'd be, you know, my aunt and my mom, and we'd all be there, and she said, can I talk to John in private? Yeah. You know, everybody's like, oh, what the fuck's going on? And, you know, of course, you know, I stayed there, and everybody left because she asked him to leave. And, um, you know, she told me to come closer, you know, because she couldn't really talk, man. She had fucking shit up her nose and everything. And uh, I'll never forget, she looked at me and just went, John, did you sign that contract? And I said, Grandma, I went down there. I went down to the recruiting guys. I did my ASVAB. Um, I passed. She said, did you sign the paper? I said to her, I did. I'm in, I'm in the debt program which is the delayed entry program. DEP just means you get to spend the summer, and right after summer, you'll get recruited. And they'll fly out to um, Illinois. And um, huh. I told her that I signed. Huh. And she did this. Okay. You can let everybody back inside. And I knew. Where I was like, okay, listen, a lot of people, they look at me and they say, oh, Captain America, that's a nickname that I have, you know, from Lord's Gym. Not many people call me that anymore. But I'm thinking to myself, you know, there's some people that join the military and they're like, okay, I joined this because I always wanted to be. Yeah. When, you know, when I was younger, I was like, oh, yeah, I want to be a police officer. I'm going to be a firefighter because, you know, schools just manipulate your mind to thinking that they're cool. But I didn't. You know, I never grew up with that, where I was like, oh, well, I want to go into the military. I was like, it's either that or you're, you're in the fucking wrong crowd. I needed to join a gang that was going to put me in the right step. So my grandmother was like, okay. She didn't say you're stupid. She never said I was stupid. She was always into wanting to force me and make me be better, the best version of myself. But... Secretly, deep down inside, she knew, John, you don't have what it takes to get yourself a scholarship to get into, like, Harvard or any good school. You know, you weren't there. You didn't put in your study time. You know, I didn't, I didn't do what I needed to do to be scholastically, you know. Brilliant. Brilliant. So she said, you got to go in the military. You have to do it. You have to do it for yourself. Yeah. Because you, you have no other fucking option. And I said, Yeah. Well, I signed the paper, and she she died peacefully. Wow. Yeah. That was a tough one. And then just fulfilled your I don't, I, Dude, I, I, you know what? Honestly, I don't, I don't even know if I did. But uh, what was I? I was good at my job, and I, I did multiple jobs in the military, but uh, I partied like a fucking asshole. Is it that part of the Navy experience? No, oh, well, I mean, there were guys that did and there were guys that didn't. Well, most did, but. And, and is that how you, uh, is that how you wound up here, right? That's the first time you found out. Yeah, man. Yeah, I came here. What this rock I is came like. here. Yeah, yeah, dude. I came back. I came here in 2001. Okay. Yeah. To 2000, 19 years ago. Man. And you came here because uh, what, the, the ship you were on? Fuck, that's a long time. It's 19 years here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Fucking old dude. And uh, so, so you got here on, what, what ship were you on? I was on the USS LaSalle. LaSalle? LaSalle. LaSalle? Yeah. As in like De La Salle? Yes. Like De La Salle, exactly. Yeah? Yeah. There's yeah. a, there's a what, what, what kind of ship is that? Capital L, A, a capital S, A, L, L, E. What, what kind of ship is that? It was an LPD converted into an AGF. Yeah, exactly. I'm seeing it right there. Oh <laughs> shit! Yeah, well, I don't need to look at that shit yeah, to understand yeah, yeah. that ship. And what was what what that was a was? piece of ship. This was a piece of ship. Yeah, why, dude, why, it what? was like it was like the third oldest ship in the navy. So harking <laughs> back to what, like World War Two? Why is Guido de Marco standing in front of the? Who the fuck is that? It's the. Uh, it's the oh well, old president. Anyway, okay, so probably because uh, he, was, I yeah, he probably went, he probably went on board. Okay, yeah. and what was what kind of ship was it? I mean, well, back, what was its yeah, function? Back, yeah, back in its day, like when you say in World War II, it, it would have functioned by having tanks in the back, and the whole back end would drop, 
Right. And you can roll tanks right out of the back of that ship because the whole back end of that ship is flat. So okay. when it hits chop, you're fucking rocking. Okay. The only thing that would prevent it from rocking a lot is ballast tanks. And those tanks, they would fill them up. Okay. So they wouldn't rock as much, but man, fuck, dude. And in 2001, obviously this is not like World War II anymore. Yeah, it's like... so it, it became, uh, it became um, a ship that was an admiral-guided flagship. So a three-star admiral basically uh, did it to... It had different functions. Like its function before the war was to um, liaison. Okay. It was to schmooze commanders. We went to Russia to, to ah. schmooze people and to say, hey, look at our clean sailors. And, you know, we're, we're nice people. We actually painted it. It used to be white. Okay. And they called it the White Ghost. And then it became gray again and became a command center. And in fact, the LaSalle was the command center of the Sixth Fleet. Uh -huh. All right. And during 9-11, when we saw 9-11, the towers coming down, and you know, we all hands on deck, got the power cords off, and we rushed out of Gaeta. We were the first respondents to be a part of the uh, surface to uh, land to surface uh, missile attack on Baghdad. Oh, okay. So I had front row seat. How did you experience that? The whole 9-11 thing? Did that, did that rile you up and want, yeah, make you want I mean, to go dude, to war? Yeah, we were rooting, tooting, ready to watch fucking fireworks, man. We were loving every fucking bomb to hit down on them. Man, oh. We just wanted to fucking annihilate any Iraqi because we felt like, okay, when we responded to Afghanistan, it was Afghanistan. And it was like, okay, now what? Oh, then it turned from Afghanistan to... Saddam Hussein, and they have weapons of mass destruction. So, Which they didn't have eventually, right? Yeah, I mean, listen, this all led to me wanting to leave the military. You know, politically, I didn't see eye to eye on these things because you start to realize that you get. It's not that you're playing on. Sense. It's not that I like the culture or I want to be a part of them. It's that. I don't want to be a part of someone that wants to annihilate anyone. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, the only thing that I want to be able to do is to protect the people that I love. And I want to build people up and make them strong. And the military doesn't do that. The military does uh, what the job is. And the job could be good. The job could be bad. And you don't have a say. You have no voice. Yeah, of course, yeah. It doesn't matter if you like the situation or not. You're going to do it. And my personality conflicts with that. I was good at my job, and I was good at, you know, physically doing what I do. But with that being said, is did I really want to do it? Okay, is my heart into doing it for that cause? No, but it doesn't matter. Because the military doesn't play games like that. Of course, The military yeah. goes by, okay, well, that's my order. You will do it. And you don't defy a direct order. Yeah. So I always tell people, especially, um, I have I have a lot of people that I speak to that are actually uh, they're Muslim people, and they always they always ask me when they find out that I'm in ex military, they always go, uh, "Did you do you agree with the situation?" And I I go, "Listen, you know, a soldier is a soldier, and a Navy guy is a Navy guy." And they go into a battle. We don't see color. We don't see creed. We see an order, and we do it, or we don't do it. You see a mission. You see, see an objective. You see an objective. And then you act either yes or you, no. So to answer your question, I'm not in the military anymore. So you can make up your own decision. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't tell people yeah, what's yeah, right yeah. or wrong, because I don't like to politically get involved with people. So... Eventually, anyway, the Navy got you into Malta, mm. 2001, and... 2001. We and actually came, we came back for two refits. But you have a Maltese connection. No, your, your, your dad's side is Maltese. My father's, yeah, so my father's side, his mom is Helen Sultana. So I actually do have Maltese blood. Okay. So maybe I'm drawn to the island. Okay. And uh, when you got here, like... They, when you got here, you already knew that you had Maltese blood? No. 
Ah, no, you didn't? No, didn't oh, know. Oh, shit, okay. No, I just told my dad when I was 25, because I met him when I was five and 25. I don't remember five, but I know when I was 25, um, he said, you've been to Malta? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, you know you're Maltese? Oh, shit. And I was like, wow. No, I didn't know that. Could have told my friend. What was, what was your uh, dad like? He's... But he's not my dad. He was a sperm donor. Okay. What is he like? Uh, as in the guy? Uh, well, you know, you really can't judge a guy by 24 hours. So that's all you met? That's all the communication you've had with your father? I learned, uh, I learned two things from him. Okay. I was told stories about him. So he, uh, he's in the mafia. Uh, Wait, your dad was in the mafia? Yeah. Well, I mean, he's affiliated with mafia people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, you you know that there's people that are like, maybe there's a dad that might not have shit and might not have any money. Yeah. So they decide to leave because they say, man, I'm a disgrace. Let me just leave because it's better off that I did. Because I'm a deadbeat. Deadbeat dad. Yeah. Well, this guy was not a deadbeat. He had money, but it's probably better that he left because he's just a deadbeat in life. Uh -huh. Just a bad influence? Probably a bad influence. Yeah. Like violence, criminality, what? Well, dude, I mean, to be honest, maybe. I don't know. You don't know. I can't yeah, yeah, yeah. say because it wouldn't be 100%. But I can only say that my mom filled my head with things, and that's not fair either. Yeah. But all I can say is that when I did meet him, I had one question for him, and he answered it very wrong. What I said, my mom took you to court and try to get you to pay for back child support. And when you went to court, this was confirmed by my grandmother, that you were, by a paternity test, 98% my father. Your lawyers were good enough to get you out and say that that's not enough to conclude that you are my child. Yet I look like you. I have ticks like you and you ran away from being my dad. Why did you leave? Why were you not my father? Why did you not pay that child support when you could have clearly done it? And he stuttered. He, he was so stressed out from it. He stuttered. He was stammering. And he said to me this. He goes, your mother wanted my money. Your mother wanted my money. I said, that wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. I called that man. Since I was six years old, my grandmother, every day on my birthday, we would call this man and say, hey, dad, I'm six. Hey, dad, I'm seven. Pick up the phone. Well, he wouldn't pick, he wouldn't answer the call? You just, like Listen, the guy never picked up the phone. He picked up the phone once because his ex-wife pretty much made him come and meet me when I was 25. The guy has not picked up the phone. I sent him a Facebook message of my child. And I said, you're a grandfather. I said, despite of all the things that we've never gone through because you weren't there, I said, I'm going to give you the right to even see him. You can go on WhatsApp. If you come to Malta, you can come and see him. Obviously, it would be supervised because I don't trust you with my kid alone. But uh, I said, if you want to have a relationship and come online and say hello and whatnot, do it. Nothing. Seen, no reply. Shit. Now, it gets even worse. His father's still alive. So it'd be like my grandfather. Never met him in my life. But I found him on Facebook. His name's Salvatore. So Salvatore... Dianotto, I find him on Facebook, and I wrote him the same message. I said, hey, you have a great-grandson. I'm the son of your father, uh, of your, of your, your son. son. And I send him a picture of my kid riding a little frog, you know, he's one of his, like, ride-on things. Seen? No reply. And I'm like, what type of asshole? Yeah, that's cold. Would, would possibly not even say, who are you? And then I met, when I went to New York, 
my cousin from that side. And he says, it's better off you didn't meet him. You know, we don't even talk to those people. So, like, what do you do when you go through school and you're like, oh, it's father and son work day. You know, go, go, because in America we have that. I don't know if you have that in Malta. No, not really. So we have a day where all the kids get really? to go out with their dad. Oh, for work, yeah. To yeah. go work with their dad because, you know, it, you know, stigma, they didn't have this woman empowerment movements back then. You know, it was like, guy works, mom's at home, go to your, go to your dad's, dad's work. Job. yeah, yeah. And I was the only stupid fucking asshole that was with, uh, you know, Billy Bob. Me and Billy Bob would be in the classroom playing tiddlywinks while everybody else was out with their dad, you know? That sucked, man. And I was like, why am I like this? You know, and you, you you wonder. And at the time, I didn't think that it affected me. But now I see that these things um, have affected me. In what, in what way? Maybe it made me to lash out and drink the way that I was drinking, uh, make choices that I made. I've made bad choices in my life. And maybe if I was guided right, I don't know. You could say a million different things. You know, you never know. But how much does that motivate you to be an incredible father? A lot, dude. Everything, I mean, right? oh, man. You know, my dad not being a part of my life is like, I'm never doing that. Yeah. I'm never not going to be a part of my kid's life. I don't care if he tells me, Dad, I fucking hate you. <laughs> yeah. I will say, good, but I'm still going to be here. You could be like, Dad, yeah. I don't want you to fucking come near me. I'll still be near you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, well, hopefully we don't get to that point, but... Yeah. yeah. It is what it is. It's, uh, it's, well, in a sense, great that you can look at your pain and, and realize that you would never want to inflict it on another human being. Right. And that you want to use that pain as the fire furnace that's going to fuel you to be just like the best father you could possibly be. That's pretty much it. Because there's a lot of challenges that come your way when you're a dad, especially nowadays. I think there's a lot of distraction. Uh, but when you have that fundamental belief that all, nothing will make sense unless you've completed the, the fatherhood mission, mm. that is such a, it's just such a turbine in your... So what, what's, of, what's the father... Mission for you? What's the mission? Ah, uh, I, I, so I think my number one role is to fill my kids with courage. Good one. Courage. Courage is the first thing. Courage. Um, courage. And why courage? Because courage. Without courage, uh, there's an old saying that says, like, without courage, you can't practice all the other virtues, right? Because of a kind person, but for me to be kind. I'm gonna have to tell someone to shut the fuck up, or I'm gonna have to overstep a bound. I'm gonna need the courage to do that. Hundred uh, percent. Otherwise, you can't practice any any of the other virtues unless you're brave enough to do it. Uh, cool. Plus, uh, courage is cu courage comes now from the friend courage from the heart. From the heart. You know, like yeah. if you if you put your heart into like the way these guys do for the podcast, uh, the way that you do with your, you can do, you can do things that are beyond like rational, like beyond. But John, haven't you, you seen, out. haven't you seen a decline in courage? Uh, not to break, you know, the, the Have I seen a decline in courage? In this day and age, mm. that's a really funny statement coming from you that you, you would number one, courage. Mm. But do you see people really acting in courage? Like, I've seen videos, like, on these YouTubes and this social media. I think social media is, like, is like the number, way, number one way to really, like, inf infiltrate people's feelings emotionally. Mm. And I've seen some videos where you're just, like, people getting brutalized. Where you're, like, man, you could say a woman getting hit by a woman. Uh, a, a woman getting hit by a man. Yeah. Or something, you know, they do these tests and pranks. Yeah, yeah. And people just walking away and it's going, oh, wow. Well, yeah. They have no courage. Yeah. You know, you think back in the 80s, man, if a man was beating on a woman, hey, what the fuck are you doing? It's yeah. simple, you know, just talk up, you know, have some courage. Yeah. I just feel like people don't really have courage nowadays. 
Uh, so it's funny that you want to foster courage, man. It, I, if I ask that I question it, to anybody else, I, I don't think it, courage would be number one. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's the thing that's going to get you the furthest. Obviously, you're going to need to espouse that Shit. with intelligence. Yeah, so, because you have to have the courage to go to school. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 you, yeah. Have the cur you have to have the courage to admit your failures or your shortcomings. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's exactly, all courage. Exactly, exactly, and, yeah. and and owning up to your shit, yeah. um, and being uh, being truthful. But you know, I I kind of see myself much in the same way as you you I guess, uh, whereby I am kind of like the safety net for my like if I think I I kind of when you ask me that I can picture my kids climbing a mountain, which right. is obviously like a metaphor for life, and they have to think that they're climbing the mountain by themselves and at a the point they're going to continue the climb by but you're themselves the belay system. but i'm just right behind them like giving them a hand up just when they need it yeah but at a point i know i'm not going to be around i know i know i'm going to get old and i'm going to die so at the point you're they're going to have to continue that that climb by themselves so if i can make them believe that they can continue the climb to wherever they want to get fuck job done 100 percent Job fucking done. So Bro, copy that took, uh, and paste what you time. just said. That's me. Amazing. Amazing. So, yeah, before you were a father, you got to Malta, no, 2001. Man. Holy cow. Loved the place. Figured out that you'd actually part Maltese. Man, dude, I partied like a fucking rock star here in 2000. How, how long were you here for? Six months. Oh, okay. Yeah, long enough to party, man. Yeah, six months of partying in Malta. Yeah. Oh, I thought... If I go to a bar and I get smashed, I'm going to get a woman. No, it was more like uh, I go to a bar, I get smashed, and I speak in tongues where women are like, what the fuck are you doing? Was that was a weird oh, thing? Yeah. Hey, guys. And they're like, well, what the fuck are you doing, man? I'm lighting myself on fire. I, I actually did that once. Okay, please uh, expand. Was yeah. that in Malta? You did that? No, I did that in New York, but yeah, it was a, that was a funny story. Why did he do that? Well, I, I didn't meanfully do it. I mean, okay. I was drinking, uh -huh. and um, I had a cuff in my pants. You had a what? Was, Sorry? A cuff in my pants. So I had my I had my pant leg rolled. Oh, uh, okay. All right. So I had a roll uh, on the back, uh, bottom of my leg pant. And I was smoking a cigarette, right? Because I used to smoke cigarettes back in the day. And I was talking to these girls. And I was like, hey, what's going on? And I was doing good. And uh, my buddy's like, oh, John hooked some women. So it was two women. <laughs> So my buddy joined the conversation, and I'm smoking, and, you know, I'm cool as fuck at the time. I threw my fucking cigarette down and continued the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, I, I, the girls that we were talking to were like, I smell something burning. <laughs> and I don't know how much I had to drink, a lot more than this, definitely. I was like, let's continue the conversation. It's important because maybe we'll go to your place, you know? Yeah. And uh, they were like, I swear I smell something burning. <laughs> and then I started feeling heat. And I was like, I looked down and I went, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> my cuff is now a big hole because my cigarette went in the cuff and just burning a hole in my jeans. So I went to stomp my foot and get this fucking cigarette to go out. And when I stomped my foot, it actually ignited a fucking real flame. Oh, wow. And my leg was on fire. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, like I really set myself on fire. Oh, okay. So it was just the leg, though. Yeah. So the girls were nice enough that, you know, the pint of beer that she had, she threw it on my leg. So the fire went out, and uh, obviously that didn't work out well. Okay. So yeah. I didn't get laid. I just had a beer-smelling leg, and some of my hairs on my uh, calf Charred. was singed. Singed. Good word. Singed. Okay. And then? That's true. Besides, um, no, then a lot of partying. I did my job. We left, and uh, okay, and um, yeah, I did. Back when Skype was like brand fucking new, man, I had a Skype interview with this guy named Damon Gallia, who was the manager of the Dahlia branch in Saint Ju of Saint Paul's Bay, mm -hmm. and I got a job there. That was my first job. Real estate, in Malta. real yeah, estate, super Maltese, bro. Super Doesn't Maltese. get more Maltese than yeah, real estate. Agent. And I lost that job within the first three months. How? 
Well, wow. they, they said, and dude, I, I sold. How do you lose a real estate job, man? Yeah. I, I dude, didn't think I, it was possible. Yeah, well, I, I lost it, and I'll tell you how. See, back in those days, um, third country nationalists couldn't be self-employed. Ah, okay, okay. So I was illegally working at... Dahlia. Dahlia, yeah. Yeah. And I wasted my fucking time, man. Did you sell Well, anything? I didn't. I, I did. I did. I did. I did. I sold two two properties. Well, one. One. One, one. property. Yeah. Uh, and it was good. Months, it's not bad. What'd you say? No, and it, a two bedroom apartment. The yeah, apartment, yeah. Uh, in uh, Bujiba. Cool. Yeah, it was a rental investment. Yeah, 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 very popular. What year was this? Uh, 2010. 2010. Ah, it was even at the boom. My no, boom was like 2015. I, I think yeah, 15 was like. May. So, I mean, if I was doing it like then, then, I would have been doing good. Mayhem, yeah, man, man. Yeah, true. Um, so, okay. And it was sales. It wasn't rents. It's no, no, sales. Sales, sales, yeah, sales, sales are far. Yeah, I was speaking to a friend of mine today who's doing letting. I was like, dude, I did letting for a bit. It's like, uh, there's a lot of, I don't know. Uh, like, you're continually on this treadmill and the, the, the payoff is very small, but it's mm. addictive. There's yeah. an addictive element to it because you can get, like, small lettings here and there and they can, like, oh, like, you're signing a contract so you feel good, but really when you add it up, Not that great, but then when you turn and when I turned to sales, that was, yeah, that was uh, that's what got me out of my financial slump, man. To be honest, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't cool. like. There was an element of me that didn't in, enjoy it. Uh, there was mm. an element of me that did because it's like there's a lot of adventure in it because you don't know, like every time you turn up for work, yeah. you don't know if you're gonna get new. fucking paid, and you don't know if you're gonna get fucking paid. Man. So you have to hunt. hunt. Like you have to really hunt and hustle. You're a fucking and, hunter. Yeah, you have to Totally. Be. You have to be. Yeah. So um, that honed that part me. But then there was some shit that was like not entirely uh, immoral or whatever. Anyway, I did it for a year. I needed to do it for a year because otherwise I was going to wind up, I don't know, destitute. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, yeah. Destitute. Yeah. So meanwhile, uh, where's where's your family in all of this? Like while all this shit going on, Navy, you have a Maltese girlfriend. Where's uh, the well, siblings, when I, the when I was in the Navy, my, my family's doing a downward spiral. I, I didn't know that the spiral was as bad as it was, uh, but my mom was losing her mind completely. Um, she lost her shit because when my sister mm -hmm. um, told my mom that daddy touches me in her private area and says it doesn't taste too good, Oh. She flipped out and went to the courts to try to win full custody and not have him any custody. The courts deemed that she was trying to be vindictive against him, and the opposite happened. She lost primary custody, oh. and she turned to drinking and then using uh, pharmaceutical narcotics like uh, Xanax. Uh, so what Xanax is what like a, sleeping like sleeping pills? No, Xanax is a uh, an anti-stress. Like when you're stressed out and you're, you know, it calms your nerves down, it just chills you out, it makes you numb. Okay, and she Now, was abusing of. So, when you take the Xanax and you drink, you right. turn into a zombie, and you actually can become a monster. Oh. And she... What, aggressive, in a sense? Oh, yeah, man. Okay. Aggressive. And she was just... what? Happened Any, the, anybody that knows Xanax and, and alcohol together, they, they know that they, they, that, that can, uh, they can destroy a family. And they destroyed your mother. Well, she found the doctor feel good, you know? She found somebody that she could, uh, you know, pay money, and then he'll prescribe her pills. And, you know, she would try to wean and not take so many pills and drink a lot on certain days and then blast down way more pills than she should be. Then she was getting prescribed the bars, Zanny bars. A lot of rappers, they talk about Zanny bars. Mm -hmm. She would get the bar where you could actually like crack it off and you take like a piece of it. Mm -hmm. She would take the whole fucking bar, man, Whoa. and just drink vodka straight. So she went from leisurely drinking with her friends And she never drank in her whole life to bumping it up and, you know, just drinking a lot. And then it would go from, you know, drinking wine to drinking what we call a, 
it's called the silk panty. It's, it's vodka mixed with peach schnapps, which is really good, actually. Then it, then it got into uh, vodka mixed with Coke, which is super cheap. And you could see that, you know, her style of drinking was just getting cheaper and cheaper. Like she would do white Russians, black Russians, silk panties, and they were drinks that bartenders make. And then she got to the point where she was then doing vodka drinks coffee. that were, you know, just who drinks that, you know? And then uh, it got to the point where she would be putting vodka in water bottles, where she'd be, like, sipping like that. And you'd know she was drinking vodka. And you, you, you either call her out on it or, yeah, you don't know. It just is what it is. I know that when I came home from the military and I was finished and done, um... Now my brother, me, me and him, we were really close, and he told me, "Hey man, when you were gone, you know, I had to deal with a lot of shit, you know, and you know, I'm not proud of you know some of the things that I've done, but I'm glad you're home." And I said to him, "Like, like, what the fuck happened?" And he says, "Dude, like, for example, you know, like Lucille came to live in the house because if there was some kind of mesquina or a mesquine in life." my mom would put um, that person into the home and, you know, say, listen, mi casa su casa. Even though she was, like, terribly... No, at this point broke. in time, she had a boyfriend that had, uh, he had decent money. He was uh, a lieutenant for a correctional facility. Okay. So he made good money. Um, so we had a house. We were living in a house. And she allowed this woman to live with her because she had a problem with her and husband. And you were at the house as well? No, I wasn't there. My so who's at the house? My brother and my mother and Ken. Okay. Ken was the boyfriend. And um, he said, dude, she slept in my room. I said, where the fuck did you sleep? She said, mom made me a bed in the, in the bathtub. How old is your brother at this point? Teenager. I'm just like, what the fuck you mean? Yeah, you know, I looked at him and I was like, what do you mean you slept in the bathtub? She's like, yeah, she put a pillow and she put the blanket in the tub and told me to sleep in the tub. You know, not a big deal. Yeah. And we thought that, he thought that this was fucking normal. And I fucking flew down the stairs and I said, I confronted my mom. Like, what the fuck did you do? Did you do this? She said, yeah, it was just a, just a moment in life, you know? I said, it was three fucking months, man. <laughs> I said, and you realize that Tom was going over his father's house all the time? And you say, that piece of shit? So of course he left the fucking house, man. You put him in the fucking bathtub. What the fuck's wrong with you? You know, and we, had a, we had a huge fight. She was complaining that, that Tommy left the house. Tommy's her brother, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Like, she felt like, uh, you know, oh, you know, if you don't want to stay on the team and stay in the house, you know, you're a piece of shit. So he was a piece of shit for wanting to leave. And I was like, he put him in a fucking bathtub. And he left the house? No, he, not, not fully. No, he would see my mom on the weekends. But he told me the story and I, I flipped out. And then I wound up getting, you know, I went to a, a friend's house. And Did I, it just I like get place. worse from there on in? Or yeah, what? Then, then we had a big fight, you know, about, you know, in the, in the meantime, you're you're working at uh, sorry, you're living in uh, in the states. Yeah, I'm back in the states. I was a gymnastics instructor. Okay. And, and by uh, this time, you're like how old? Roughly. Twenty five. Roughly twenty five. Okay. And my brother's fifteen. Just telling me stories. And I just think to myself, like. What else has gone on, you know? And he said, you don't know. You know, I, bro, you, you, you catching me smoking weed. It's not like a big deal, man. I've been drinking since I was like nine. So when I went to the military, like this kid was drinking box wine. Because my mom would bring At in box 15? wine. 15? No, 15. No, man. Nine. At nine, he's drinking box wine. Fuck. Yeah, okay. Nine, drinking box wine. That rhymes. Um, yeah, he was drinking box wine because his friends would come over 
you know, the next door neighbor. And the kids would be, you know, she's up there. Or drinking nine year olds, like drinking fucking alcohol. Two or three, maybe. Yeah, they would just come in and go downstairs and. Yeah, normal shit for them. I didn't see that. I didn't see those things. Because you were, where were you? I was in the military. You were in the military. Yeah, I was going. I was 23,000 miles away. I did see it a little bit. So here's my confession. This is why I feel bad for not being the brother that I should have been, is that when I came, uh, I graduated boot camp, and we were all given time to go back home and just relax. Yeah. You know, you made it through boot camp. You Congratulations. Here's your time with your family. I went and spent time with my family. And that time wasn't a good time. You know, we we fought because, you know, I found out that my mom was an addict. And I told her, fuck this, I'm not coming back. And I sold a lot of days back to the military. So the military gives you a certain amount of days. And the days that I accrued and sold back, I think I made over $1,000 in just vacation time that I just didn't take. So they'd be like, do you want to go anywhere? I was like, no. Why don't you want to go see your family? I'm like, it's okay. So that was my fault. I did have a fucking family. I had my brother, even though I didn't like what my mom was doing and that, you know, I could have gone down to just grin and bear it. I wasn't there for him, you know? Yeah, and it did end good with your brother, no? Yeah, he resented me for that a little bit, but he always loved me. I was his favorite, you know, because he had brother from his father's side and a sister from his father's side. And he's got me from my mom's side and he's got his sister from my mom's side. And he always, me and him were usually peas and pod, man. And uh, I left him. I left him totally. Yeah, I, that's something that I have to. That's something I have to live with. I don't. I don't let it affect my family. I don't let it affect the way that I'm raising my son. But it's something that I think about. It's something that I know I could have done things differently. I don't say I am the reason why he's not on this earth, but I know that I could have done more. So, uh, so yeah. How, how did it end up that your brother is not on this earth? Oh, well, my brother, he got involved with you know, people that were uh, shady characters. And um, he'd be like the thug. You know, he was street smart, you know, I'm, I'm going to go into areas that I'm not allowed to go into because he could, because um, he had big balls, you know. And uh, he um, he got into being exactly like my mom, you know. He used Xanax. He drank. He did drugs, you know. He, he used to smoke weed to stop stammering because he actually developed a stammer due to... Probably the verbal abuse, you know, because we, we were verbally abused, man. Now, if you were told every day of your life that you're a piece of shit, you're going to believe it, man. So I think my brother got, I got it as well, but he got it on a different level. You know, and I, I just, I, I thought to myself, fuck, man. Did, did your I brother would... get it on a different level as in, I'm, I'm assuming on a worse level, is that correct? Yeah, you got it on a worse a level. more intense level. So I, is, is it because your mother was getting progressively worse? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she fell into addiction. So when I when I when I joined the military, she had just been a you know, maybe like a party girl because she never drank a day of her life and then all of a sudden she's now going out and drinking. And it was almost like, "Oh, fun to see your mom go out and party." And then it turned into something way fucking worse. And my brother really saw that more than more than more than I did, and that, that, that's uh, that's super unfortunate that I didn't understand the gravity of it. That's that's the hardest part is that when I was 
you know, doing what I was doing, my brother was living a different life. Hmm. So, okay, were there negative things that I went through in my childhood? Yeah. But he went through a whole different, he went through a whole different thing. And uh, I didn't understand it because I, 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 uh, I did understand it to some degree. I knew I didn't want to be a part of it. And I said to myself, okay, I can't, I can't be there. I got to, you know, reduce my time from. So your brother was getting like caught up in gangs. Oh, yeah. Is that kind of thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was boosting cars and uh, he was robbing. Okay. He was stealing. Like homes and stuff like that? I don't think, I don't think a home, no. Uh, cars, tool sheds. Like, I mean, I think, he, I think he even stole a chainsaw and tried to sell it to his dad. Like, I mean, at the point though, you did, because if I remembered the story entirely correctly, you were in Malta yeah. while, while your brother was kind of going off the rails. Yeah, I was. And then at the point you decided that you needed to step in, no? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was his, uh, it was, uh, his ex-girlfriend, Kristen. Okay. She messaged me on Facebook and said, listen, I'm going to let you know that Thomas, um, stole from a friend's car of mine and we caught him red handed. And it's not the fact that, you know, we're not dating right now, but your brother's really bad. He's on serious drugs and he doesn't even know what the fuck he's doing. And I said, are you serious? And she says, yeah, he really needs you. So I said to my ex-girlfriend at the time, I got to leave. And uh, I'm going to go to New York. And she said, oh, yeah, well, I want to go to Spain anyway. And, you know, when you sort things out, maybe we'll meet in Spain. And I said, okay, but I have to take care of my family. So we we separated. Um, she went to Spain, and I went to America. And the relationship didn't work out anymore, and I tried to take care of my family. And um, the first day I landed in New York, uh Sue, which is Tommy's um, stepmom at the time, said, can I meet you and tell you what's going on? Let's try to come up with a way to get him to go to a program to rehabilitate, rehabilitate him. himself. Yeah. And I said, okay, that's cool. Let's talk about it. Tommy found out that I talked to Sue and thought that I was a piece of shit. So the first two weeks that I was there, he refused to talk to me. On the second week, he said, oh, bro, I love you. Let's meet up. I met up with him, and he came out of a car with that. He was actually driving. And he came out, and he looked disheveled, man. If, if I could use an adjective, it would be disheveled. And I've never seen my brother like that because my brother always took pride in, you know, looking fresh. You know, haircuts and everything. How did that make you feel like seeing your brother come out? I, w I was, you know, some people would say sad. I was mad. I was angry because it was an old John. You know, I didn't, I didn't understand it. You know, so I was pissed. I was pissed that he was, that he was at that level. I was mad. And I looked at him and I said, what the fuck are you doing, man? And he's like, oh, this is how we talked. Oh, bro, yeah, man, what's up, man? Eyes rolling. Totally fucked off. What's he on by this time? Is I said, How Xanax? I don't, even, I don't even know. I, I mean, yeah, he was taking Xanax. But then I found out that he was taking Suboxone, which was uh, a synthetic heroin. Okay. That if you want to get off heroin, apparently you take these pills that are similar to it. Yeah, but he was partying with them, right? Like using it with Xanax, he was, alcohol. He was fucking driving with them, man. Fuck, yeah. So I, I, I told him, like, dude, how did you make it here? Yeah. Alive. Um, we went to um, a restaurant where obviously I paid because these guys don't have fucking money. And I'll never forget, the waiter looked at me like, what are you doing with these two people? Because, you know, I'm obviously with full. You're looking sober. Yeah, I'm a sober guy and you got two people that is zombies because he came with his girlfriend at the time. Um, who was also an addict or I don't even know what she was man she said she was a waitress but 
I think she was a stripper. I don't. I don't even know. But was she was. fucked off her face? Just oh like yeah, zombie do. Zombie duck okay. all over the place. And um, I was sitting there, and I'll never forget it. I had the. It was the Outback Steakhouse, and I was having a uh, the beef dip. Both have beef dip, and we're talking. And the conversation was good because we were talking about normal shit. And his girlfriend chimed in and said, look, Tommy, look at that little boy. And I looked over, and there was a little boy. She goes, oh, we should go over there and take him. And I looked at her, and I went, the fuck? What the fuck are you talking about, man? And I looked at Thomas and I said, I said, dude, what are you with right now? What the fuck is going on? He's like, she's just playing, dog. She says, no, I totally take that fucking kid. We could raise him. And I said, I can't even raise your eyelids. What could you raise, man? What the hell are you saying, man? And I told my brother right in front of her face, I said, what are you with this trash, man? And he looked at me and he's like, oh. He's like, what am I going to do? So I find out that Sue and his father threw him out of the house because he was too hard to deal with. And it's a tough love. So they, they beat themselves up over it, or Sue does, I think, more than the father does. Um, and shit, I would too. I would feel bad, you know? We're not on a bad relationship. Um, she talks and comments on my Facebook, which Facebook is just used for my business. He's a, I don't really use it to communicate with people. Um, she takes it seriously hard because she feels that she let him go. And, you know, we did. We did. We let him, we let him live with certain people and make bad choices, and we weren't there to foster him. He was my little brother, you know? And I think I could have done a better job. Uh, like, John, I didn't, I didn't know how to... I didn't even know what kind of emotions to feel, you know, at this time, you know? And now, I feel sorry that I didn't step in the way that... If I, if I had been given this from what I know now, I would have handled it differently. Mm. But the only thing that I could have said was is that I said, I love you, but you're fucking up. You, you, you're fucking up horribly and you got to fucking change your shit and get your shit together. And um, funny enough, two days after that, he called me up and he was telling me about, you know, how I was his hero and that he loved me so much, you know, and uh, we had, I think, about a two-hour conversation on the phone and we just talked, man. I had to connect my phone to the charger. I mean, we just talked all all night long. And he told me, you know, like, you're the only one I really connected with and I love a lot. And uh, I want to move in with you. I want to get out of here and, you know, do better. And, um, you know, it's hard to say because uh, after that phone call, I mean, he died uh, one day after that. And uh, I told him I put in an application to, um, you know, uh, to a couple of um, to a couple of police academies to get a job, you know, working as a police officer, and I told him we have to get out of New York and and, and we'll move in and you can move in with me, but I, I don't have the resources to, you know, get an apartment with you right now. And he just said, "No, man, we'll stay in New York and you know let's move in together and you know I'll make money, you know." And uh, I told him, "No, it doesn't work that way, you know." And uh, what do you do when your little brother reaches out for you, tells you that you're his hero, and he's asking you for help, and you don't have the resources to help? You know, that's, that's huge, you know. And um, when I got the phone call from Sue saying that my brother is dead, uh, I just said, I just said no, and it was a, a surreal moment. And um, most people would turn to alcohol. Like, I was an alcoholic, and I didn't turn to alcohol. I actually I stayed away from everyone. I shut off. 
totally shut off. I wrote my feelings on paper, and um, I spoke uh, at his funeral, and um, with the way that I spoke about my brother, most people thought that I was his father, and his actual father had, uh, you know, spoke, and he said, you know, you really have to watch your kids, and you never know uh, when their last day could be, so, you know. They just thought that maybe he was a friend. So it was uh it was hard. And I, I felt like I felt like uh I was the only man in that room. And I think I cried more in that moment than I ever cried in my life. I think that I could have grown fucking crops with my tears. And uh I'm not a big guy to cry, you know. I cried when my, my son was born. And I cried when I saw my brother laying in a casket. And I didn't think that that's something that I would do when he was 24 years old. Just not something that he, I don't think anything in this world can prepare you for that. Like if any anyone was to go, it should have been me, you know? I'm 10 years apart from him. So in theory, you know, we should have lived a long life and I should have gone and he should have gone after. And it didn't, didn't, didn't turn out that way. And then you... I get all the people that say, John, it wasn't your fault. And okay, you can say that. But you know what? I could have done a lot more. And some people say, but you weren't good enough in life to help him at that point in time. And that's the part that kills me the most, is that listen to that statement. You weren't good enough to help your brother when he calls you and tells you that you're his fucking hero, his hero couldn't save him. That just hits you. You're like, boom. And most people, they think it's a joke. You know, when I tell them that story, they're always, you know, in the, in the world we, we live in now, you know, when you tell somebody something real, like I'm telling you, most people will justify you know, my actions. And I, I don't need somebody to justify it. I know that it could have been there more. I know I could have done a lot more. And then people say, no, do, don't bang yourself up for it. Do I bang myself up for it? No. I provide for my kid, and I don't let it get to me to the point where I'm going to hurt other people's lives. But I hold it right here. And I know I could have done more. I know that this kid loved me with every bone in his body, no matter how addicted he was, he still was a good person. And that good person needed a good brother. And at that time, I wasn't a good fucking brother. And, and what did you take from that? I took a huge fucking lesson. That's the biggest lesson that you'll ever learn in your life. When you lose someone that you love, there's no, there's no other, there's no other lesson harder than that. When you lose someone, Like, I don't know if you have a brother or a sister. Imagine losing that person and knowing that they reached out for help for you. They said, you know, John, can I live with you? And you say, I can't, because at the time I was living with a friend. He was helping me out. I didn't have a, a home of my own. Of course I would have let him live with me if it was my apartment. But I didn't have it. Imagine if your brother or your sister said, John, I need a place to stay. I need to live with you. Let's try to get better. I know that I'm in the wrong. Let's make it right together. Hmm. And you can't be there. What, what could you have done different? Because it would have been, the way I'm perceiving it is that it, there would have had to be a, a whole sequence of yeah. decisions yeah. for you to get to a point where you're stable enough and, yep. and resourceful enough in order yep. to support the brother that's reaching out for you. Yep. Like, that's, I want to be the guy that's, that, 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 that says, like, don't beat, beat yourself up. Because, like, how the fuck are you going to know yeah. that your bad decisions are going to lead to a crisis point where your brother's going to need you and you're not going to have the resources to, yeah. to, to sort that shit out. I mean, I, I think I reason it this way, is that I say, okay, well, 
could I have done anything different? Um, we can always say, oh, in hindsight, yeah, you could uh, do something different. I could yeah. have done something monumental and something crazy. I could have taken my savings, which I had savings, and and, and put it down a down payment on an apartment, and we could have failed, you know, miserably and been kicked out of that apartment. Could I have done that? Yes. I didn't do that. Okay. But when you ask that question and you say that, it's like, yeah, I play that over in my head. There's nothing else I could have done in that point in time. But I hold myself accountable for it. And I don't do it in a negative way where I say, okay, I'm going to beat myself up and I'm going to kill myself over it. But I hold it to the back of my head. And then you know what? I do it in, 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 if I could use it in a positive way, I say it like this, John. If there's someone that I can help, I'll do it in my brother's name. I have to honor my brother and help someone that could be leading off into the wrong, wrong road. Now, that doesn't mean drugs. It could mean, okay, listen, maybe a kid's being raised by parents or a parent that isn't fully there. You know, Maybe they're young, they don't have their shit together. And usually when people don't have their shit together, they raise their kids with their shit not together. And then that kid will continue that cycle. And uh, I, I would like to say that if I could break the cycle and reach out to one, maybe two, maximum three people, if I can reach out and just help one, then I can say that at least I did it in my brother's name. Then I could say I helped someone. So if uh, anyone's listening to this podcast and perhaps you're that person or you know someone who could have a, a shoulder to lean on and, and could get some guidance and some fortitude and through physical training uh, can uh, fortify his his mind and his attitude uh, well just just write to me and I, I'll be sure to uh, to put you guys in touch cool man and and and, and we'll do that in, in Tommy's Tommy's name man it's fucking hard it's yeah. fucking hard and and in the meantime like your your, your mom's like not doing too well or no my mom passed away as well so uh my mom passed away uh before my brother died oh. and when my uh when my mom passed away i uh we had a lot of resentment towards um you know ultimately i mean i went i went through so i got a dwi i actually Which is uh, driving yeah driving while intoxicated Okay. So uh, I went out with a bunch of, you know, some sailors that, you know, came down to, hey, show me a good time. And we went out to strip clubs, everything, the whole nine. Um, I was pulled over, and they gave me a sobriety test, which obviously I failed miserably. And uh, they sent me down to the station, and uh, I was charged with that DWI. I was uh, three times over the illegal limit, and um, that came with a consequence. It also came with a huge fine, which I didn't have the money to pay for this fine. And go figure, you know, my brother was hit by a car riding his bike on the service road, which he shouldn't have been there anyway. And when he was hit by the uh, car, obviously his father got him in touch with a lawyer and they sued and he won $50,000. Uh, $50, say $50,000, and I think this was the decline in my brother. My brother was a super hard worker. He worked for his first car, which was a Chrysler 300M, and this kid used to bust his ass at McDonald's. This guy was, I used to call him Burger Mechanic because this guy could put together burgers like, make the burgers, and I was super proud of him because when I saw him making those burgers, I didn't see a kid that's just making burgers. I saw a kid that made burgers like I've never seen any fucking kid make burgers. I was like, damn, dude. So you know what they say? They always say, you know, if you're going to do something, do it fucking great. Yeah. yeah like we were my, saying before, huh? Man, my fucking brother did it, man. I mean, like, dude, when this guy did it, he had to make sure he was the best. When he was a pizza delivery kid, he made more deliveries than anyone else did. He was like the... He got away with stupid shit. Like, he would have his dog all the time with him. And he would put his dog in the fucking front seat and then the pizza would be in the back. <laughs> it's crazy, man. This kid just got away with so much shit, you know. Um, but, man, he's just, he worked. And when he won that money, he, he, we, we saw a decline in him. 
then he started, you know, being a big bowler, Man. you know, doing hotel parties and saying, you know, like, I'm going to fund everybody. Man. Well, he funded my fucking ticket too. So when I needed him, that dude picked me up because I didn't have a license anymore, obviously. I'm, I'm, he said, pick me up, bring me to work. Paid my fucking fine, man. $2,000, man. Bam. So I walked up to the, the counter, and he didn't tell me that he was going to pay my fine. We came down to the Department of Motor Vehicles together because I didn't have a car. Yeah, he'd drive me there. And it was this woman, and she was a big piece of shit, huh? She just looked at me and goes, she looked at me like, you're a scumbag, you know, delinquent of, you know, driving while intoxicated. And, and you know, fair enough. You know, judging books by the cover, totally looked at me like I was a piece of shit. And she goes, so I'm assuming that you're going to be making payments. And my brother said, who the fuck do you think you're talking to? Like, you're a fucking social worker. I mean, you're, you're, you're a government worker. Like, treat us with fucking respect, man. And she's like, excuse me? And he goes, we're not going to be making payments. We're just going to pay this fucking fine. How much is it? That would be two thousand dollars. He goes, bomb, threw it out like a like a gangster. Just threw down two thousand bucks. He knew it was gonna be money, huh? He just threw it down there and he goes, "Give me the receipt. We're fucking done with you." <laughs> well, that's how he was, you know. Um. So he was there for me. Yeah, that's another thing that fucking helps me, is that my brother was the type of person that he would give you the shirt right off his back if that's what you needed. But yet, you know, did he do stupid shit? Mm. Did he die in a... You'd look at him and say, oh, he did this, he did that, he's a bad person. He's not a bad person. He died of, uh, like, intoxication, like drugs, overdose? Oh, yeah, he overdosed. He took a Suboxone. He, I think he cocktailed it with uh, Xanax and alcohol. And he just slipped away. Heart gave way or... You know, honestly, John, I didn't get involved with understanding the whole story completely because I know the type of person that I am. And if I got involved with it, then I probably would have went to jail. I, I said, I honestly, need to step back. I need to regroup. Mm. And I didn't talk to any family members. There were two days where I just... I went off grid. And I just said, I have to... I had to meditate. I had to, I had to focus on what's important, and I didn't turn to drinking. I didn't uh, turn to. It didn't kick in until I saw him. Um, he had an open casket, and um, when I walked into the room, I just. I don't even think I really saw anything because I think I was just constantly under. Tears, streaming tears. So everything was like. Uh, like when you're swimming in a swimming pool and you're looking under the swimming pool. Yeah. I think that was kind of like that. And uh, uh, after all this, like you told us some pretty mad stories, uh, a lot of uh, pain there and, and emotional anguish. Uh, where are you? Where are you now? Like in your life? How yeah, old are you now, bro? How old are you now? I'm 39. 39. All right. 39, feeling fine. You're looking over the hill. Yeah, man, dude, I'm getting some grays in here. Yeah, they're... <laughs> yeah, likewise, dude. Coming out, dude. It's okay. At least you keep fit, man. I'm keeping fat. <laughs> hey, man, they're both with Fs, dude. <laughs> and you know what? You're in shape because round is a fucking shape. I would have preferred if you went, ah, you're not that bad, but yeah, round is a shape. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pretty truthful guy, man. <laughs> uh, I didn't expect anything I thought of you, bro. Uh, so yeah, what, where, where, what's your, where, where's your mindset at now? Like after all that life story, uh, what's the present like? Okay. Um, they say you live and you learn. Mm -hmm. And dude, every day is... Uh, a learning day, man. We, 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 um, we go through life and I believe that everything they say happens for a reason. And I don't like to say that that should have happened, but through my brother passing and through my life and all the things that I've done, it's, it's made me a better person. Um, 
I reevaluated the stupid shit that I was, and I understood that, man, I'm a piece of shit at this moment. I couldn't, I couldn't help a brother. Um, I didn't have my own place. Now I have all those things. Uh, I have a, I have a little, I have a little me running around that needs to depend on me, and I'm there. What's your kid's name? Tommy, yeah, Thomas. So I named him after my brother, and it's funny because uh, uh, me and Melanie, we, we we were talking when we were dating, and she said, you know, um, you know, if I ever had a child, I would really love to name him Thomas because it's just a name that me and my sister said if we had a boy, we would name him that. I said, wow, it's really meant to be that we're together because if we have a kid. I want to name my son Thomas, and I told her the story about my brother and how he how he how he died. So that was uh, that's weird that you, that you asked that question and that she actually wanted that name as well. So it wasn't just me. Well, I obviously asked the question because before yeah. we yeah. started shooting, yeah. we had a little call with your with your son. And uh, I remember, yeah. wait, he was calling him Tommy and his brother is Tommy. And now it's like uh, your brother is living vicariously through your son. And now you have the resources to provide for your son. Now yep. you're there for your son. Yep. So to me, that's a uh, redemption, man. I think so. That's I, w- I would, uh, You know, sometimes I feel like um, that he's like re- reincarnated and then he's there because he always looked up to me like a dad. And if he was reincarnated, it's almost like now I am his dad. That's dope. And I feel like um, it's an extension. And I he's, wish you he's, well. he's Thomas Cogswell, so he's got my he's got my name. He's got my brother's name. Yeah. It's totally. Yeah, hundred percent. Turn up at Chiswick and they start calling him Cogswell as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know that that actually my Chiswick's uh, we're looking at Chiswick. Um, so, uh, bro. Let's go to the, let's go to the, it's like a quick fire, yeah, fun round, right? All right. Uh, which is a bit lighter than everything else. Uh, so what music do you listen to and why? Oh man, dude. Uh, what kind of music do I listen to? All right. So if I'm, so if I'm running, mm-hmm. go figure this out. And if mm-hmm. I'm running and I really, really push in the heart rate, mm-hmm. I actually listen to uh, Indian yoga music. Oh, wow. Yeah, Sad the Guru. So I go into Sad the Guru's uh, mix, mm-hmm. and it's like more chanting music. To be this is like upbeat. No, 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 man, no. It's slow, and 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 how I reason that is that when I listen to it, it actually calms me down. Okay. So when I'm running and I'm pushing the heart rate, and it's pumping. Mm-hmm. I want the music to actually take my heart rate down, mm-hmm. so that I can last. Because I really don't want to endure something for very long when I have metal music popping out. And I'm blasting off because then I'm over revving. It's like uh, it's like racing a car, and you're not shifting out of second gear. Man, you need to give it to the next gear so that you're not pressing those gears out. Mm-mm. So if the music's too hard for me, it gets me overexcited, and then I start to burn out. So this music kind of levels me, keeps me steady. Cool. Now if I'm lifting a heavy deadlift, hard rap, hard rock, yeah. disturbed system of down. Yeah, I, I remember uh, doing uh, doing heavy deadlifts uh, or front squat. You remember, you know, you know, Randon, of course, he's the guy that introduced yeah. us. Randon used to love the front squat. I remember oh, he was like obsessed with the front yeah. squat, and he got me obsessed with the front squat as well. So every morning we would turn up at Lords and yeah. we would do like, and he would put M M&M and M on. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and something like that. For yeah. sure, at like eight a.m., Steve yeah. would turn up, and oh, Steve yeah. would go, "This is the devil's music." Yeah, and, and he like, <laughs> put on some Jesus and shit. Not Jesus, stuff, no, just like more non. Uh, oh man! Violent, then, aggressive. Then, stuff. then, dude, you 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 met a different Steve, man. I mean, dude, sometimes he put on straight up gospel. Yeah, no, no, he did. He he. Uh, I mean, like he impressed. Like at one point, I uh, I, I turned to Steve and I said, Steve, what's what? what do you have like a couples uh, membership? And he said, Listen, uh, in the Bible it says when uh, two people uh, get married, they're one. So you only pay for one membership for you and your wife. Oh so wow! Like, wow. Yeah, that's deep. Wow, shit, yeah. I didn't know that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if there's one exercise we should all be doing, what is that exercise? Uh, it depends on the person. It depends on what they want to do in life. It's tough 
mm-hmm. but if you're really athletic, mm-hmm. I'd say if I was to say to any athlete out there, mm-hmm. the number one exercise would be sprinting. 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 Hills? Just sprinting in general. You can do it on a hill. You can do it flat. Sprinting is amazing. Sprinting is amazing. Cool. Yeah. But it's very, very taxing on the body. So then that goes into age, who you are, what you do. So I would say no sprinting because then you'll pull things. Like for me, if I really sprint and I give it my all, I'm always leaving with an injury. So oh. it's very, very, very taxing on the body. So with that being said, then I always break it down to four exercises. Okay. You have the deadlift. Okay. You got the squat. Yeah. You got the bench press. And yeah. you got the pull-up. Yeah. For if sure. you do those four exercises, you will forge a strong body. If you want to be any better than doing that, and that's all accessory. Cool. Uh, BJJ? BJJ. I, I, I like it, man. It's for me. I like it. Um, I found a good gym. Which is? They used to be a rate. Now they're advent guard. Yep. Yeah. Same Super gym. pros. Yeah, they're really professional in what they do. Yeah. There's such a great community vibe there. Yeah. New gym now. Damn, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark fucking furnished half of it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't Mark's expect any less. That guy. <laughs> yeah, that fucking guy. Yeah, 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 Huge, man. Huge, like... Massive uh, dude. I didn't think it was that big. Yeah, yeah and they have, like a, they have, like, a conditioning room. They have yeah. the rolling room and the, and the drill room. And it's, like, massive. It's, like, it's just... Go, there's like a bend it's so big it's so massive it like bends around it's like 200 right. square meters or maybe even more yeah. yeah how they put the mats in is amazing how they went around that bend like that yeah I'm sure mats. Mark figured that one out probably <laughs> I mean cuts yeah. with his saw and shit yeah. Mark and Trevor Mark and Trevor yeah cause Trevor is an artist so he has the eye for that shit Trevor, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I man I haven't done it in like four or five months now like i was really longer, really loving just saying that for the podcast probably no no about four or five months mark mm-hmm. yeah been? mark's been rolling been? his fucking eyes at me shit. yeah no oh, four or five maximum six months no, four, or five. four or five months yeah, 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 yeah. i'm right close I'm right. to six no man four to five yeah i know yeah, yeah, yeah. But five is right right before six yeah yeah, yeah no it's not gonna get to six because so you're gonna actually say half a year gonna, um, are you really yeah, next next week. I, yeah, next right. week. I, I'll hold you to definitely, it. Definitely going to get back. Right. Definitely going to get back. Um, so, yeah, bro. Um, where can people find you? Slima. So, I'm, I'm at Exiles now. So, okay. I've been, you're obviously you know, a boomer. Bro. Hold on, hold on a second. You're obviously a boomer. Right? When, when people say, where can people find you? They go, oh, this is my Instagram handle. This is my Facebook thing. And this oh, is where. Oh, yeah, man. Dude, you were. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Dude, I'm totally, yeah. yeah no, I'm totally not, I'm booming. Not, oh, man. Yeah, I'm not, dude, I don't. <laughs> so you're you're like uh, Force Fit? Force Fit, yeah. Is that where they can find you? Like, yeah. is it Force Fit Malta uh, or what I, is it? On, uh, on Facebook, I think it's John Spartan. Okay. And then it'll say Force Fit in brackets, I think. Okay. And my Instagram, which Instagram's popular, mm-hmm. um, it's Force Fit Malta. One word. Dope. Dope. Yeah. Okay, before we close, anything you'd like to add? Oh, I had a great time, dude. Um, telling my story was, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm honored that you brought me on the show, first of all. Um, you've always been, you know, an awesome dude in my life as well. I didn't know that I helped you out, but I'm really, I'm really stoked that I could have helped you out of a hard time. And it makes me feel better because, you know what, there, um, there's a saying that says that, you know, there are people that want to change the world, but that's impossible because all we need to do you just care about one person hard and if you can help one person and if everybody helped one person we would all be taken care of so if i could say that you confirm that i helped you out in a hard time that at least i reached out and i touched somebody yeah so i feel like that's that's a that's a fucking achievement and i I feel good that i could have that so i i thank you for that and i thank you for bringing me on the podcast dude it's been nothing but uh dude super experience uh and on that note uh bro it's a privilege to know you it's an honor to call you a friend yeah man and uh, i wish you every success and i wish your family incredibly well i can't wait to see what uh, kind of man tommy is gonna grow up uh, to be um yeah just thank you so much for being so open with us and uh, for sharing um that's all from my end 
Uh, guys, thank you for, for tuning in for yet another week. Uh, I'll see you next week.